Technology has more than 25 years of experience in international cooperation, sustainable development, humanitarian coordination, and peace and security. In Kenya, after holding other leadership positions across the organization, including resident representative of the United Nations Development Program and representative of the United Nations Population Fund in Kenya, regional director for the Middle East and Europe for the United Nations Office for Project Services in Denmark and chief of staff in the United Nations Assistance Mission for Iraq. Without further ado, it is my honor to welcome to the podium UN Resident Coordinator in China, Mr. Sadar Chatterjee for opening Kenya. remarks. Regional Director. Your Excellency Ambassador Wu, uh, highly admired colleague also from the United Nations system as the former Under Secretary General for the UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs. Excellencies present, my colleagues from the UN family, colleagues from CCG, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'm pleased to welcome you all here for this very ideal setting for this event. First, I wish to express my heartfelt thanks to the Center for China Globalization for partnering with the United Nations family in China to co-host this afternoon's high-level symposium. We in the UN are indebted to CCG for its very generous support on the organization of the symposium to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the restoration of China's lawful seat to the United Nations. 2021 is genuinely a critical year for China and the world. It marks the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party, the successful establishment of a moderately prosperous Xiao Kang society, and the 50th anniversary of the restoration of the lawful seat of the People's Republic of China to the United Nations. For the past 50 years, we have witnessed the miraculous economic and social transformation that have taken place in this country. During this time, China has lifted over 750 million people out of absolute poverty, strengthened investment in education and public health to create a happier and a healthier workforce, become the world's factory, and multiplied its GDP from a cur per capita of a mere $180 in 1979 to $12,000 today. The United Nations system in China has been a trusted development partner of China with the first UN offices established in China back in 1979. In the four decades that following that year, the role of the UN in China has shifted from a traditional donor to that of a partner providing technical expertise and support both within and beyond its national boundaries, including in its activities under the framework of South-South cooperation. As we celebrate the great progress achieved, we also need to focus on the challenges ahead. There is no doubt that humanity has entered a decisive decade for our world. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken the lives of about 5 million people and significantly disrupted the global economy. The impact of COVID-19 has an even larger impact on the vulnerable population with as many as 150 million people brought back to extreme poverty by 2021. To realize the goals set in the 2030 agenda, targeted and innovative solutions are needed for rapid, sustainable recovery. With the world struggling to re uh, recover from the impact of the pandemic, another systemic crisis is imminent. The time remaining for human beings to reverse climate change is running out. As the United Nations Secretary General has noted, this is a code red for humanity and has struck that we need to act fast to avoid the point of no return. 
faced with global uncertainties, China has a number of challenges in achieving its ambitious development goals. China needs to bridge the gap between the rural and the urban areas, boost up its social security systems to care for the vulnerable and leave no one behind. Moreover, China needs to transition to a new development paradigm, a green, equitable, sustainable growth model that aims to achieve common prosperity for all people. We are pleased to see that China is preparing to move fast to address these challenges, and these have been included in its 14 five-year plan. We in the United Nations stand ready to work with the government and the people of China to realize um, these ambitious plans, such as rural revitalization, peaking carbon emissions by 2030, and achieving carbon neutrality by 2060. Ladies and gentlemen, let us reflect on the following key questions. How will the future collaboration between the United Nations and China look like? How can the UN be fit for purpose in China to deliver with greatest, greater impact for the next 50 years? I can talk about my experience when I worked in Africa on developing partnerships between the UN, the government of Kenya, businesses including technology companies like Huawei from China, Safaricom from Kenya, as well as Merck from the United States, Philips from the Netherlands, GlaxoSmithKline from the UK. Together, we were successfully able to reduce the high burden of maternal mortality in some of the most high burden counties in Kenya. Most recently, Huawei, the UN, and the government of Kenya have implemented telemedicine projects which are now being scaled up nationwide, and these projects can be replicated globally. In this decade of action to realize the sustainable development goals by 2030, the UN has more than ever positioned itself to build partnerships with the private sector, nonprofit organizations, to unlock cutting edge solutions to global challenges like shared prosperity and climate change. Today, we are honored to have leading experts from the Chinese government, the UN country team in China, to discuss the future collaboration between the UN and China on precisely these two areas, inequality and climate change. Both challenges are complex and multifaceted. The kind of intellectual exchanges that we are today promoting together with our co-host, CCG, is essential to prepare us to adapt and act fast to form effective, impactful partnerships around key development issues. In conclusion, let me reiterate that the UN will continue to march in lockstep with the people of China to defend multilateral cooperation and contribute towards global governance. As President Xi Jinping said in the 76th UN General Assembly, the baton of history has been passed to our generation and we must make the right choice, a choice worthy of people's trust of our times." Unquote. The UN is in China is here to work with you, side by side, united for a better world. I wish to thank you all most sincerely for having made the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chatterjee. Your speeches never fail to inspire. Our next speaker is founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization, Dr. Henry Wang Hui Yao. Dr. Wang serves as a counselor to the State Council of the People's Republic of China and vice chairman of MoFCOM's China Association for International Economic Cooperation. He is also dean of Institute of Development Studies of Southwestern University of Finance and Economics of China. Dr. Wang, please. Thank you, Dr. Tan, and uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Seed Chatterjee, His Excellency, Ambassador Wu Hongbo, His Excellency, Ambassador Mohammed Osam, His, uh, His Excellency, Madato Nadia, and also Director General, Mr. Tian Ning. And of course, our distinguished uh, uh, UN representatives and our colleagues, experts, and media friends, ladies and gentlemen, you are all welcome very much to CCG. So today is actually a very special occasion, and we are actually very honored 
to collaborate with you in China to actually celebrate the China and the United Nations 50 years and beyond. First, I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for China Globalization at this special occasion, and also to commemorate the restoration of China's lawful seats to the United Nations, jointly hosted by the United Nations China and CCG. Today, honorable representative from UN system, Chinese government officials, representative from embassies and international organizations, and also our other experts in China are gathered here at CCG to share their insights and stories of the friendship and the cooperation between China and the UK, UN, and of course, look forward to the future. During a recent dialogue I had with uh, my friend Kishu Mafbani, someone who also worked for UN for 10 years as a Singapore, ex-Singaporean ambassador to the UN and president of the uh, UN Security Council, he actually told me that he loves the UN and thinks the UN is one of the most wonderful organizations in the world, and the UN Charter is the one of the most beautiful documents in the world. As a globalist and an advocacy for multilateralism, I myself also too feel the same way and share this version of his and everyone here for the UN to contribute to make the world a better place. The United Nations General Assembly is a crucial place to unite everyone in every corner of the world, addressing the global issues and push forward the sustainable development goals for the future of mankind and our beloved planet. As a matter of fact, we are today gathered here just in the, amongst the big COP26, which is held at Glasgow by, by UN, and also just finished the G20 summit in Rome uh, these last days. So 50 years is actually not a short time, and uh, it's constant changes and shift has, has made in the, in the global contest. China's participation to the UN system has made a significant advancement, improved its status and uh, in international community, contributed to the global unity and is initiative with, with resilience. It has a story of a change making. It has become a major contributor to the peacekeeping force of the UN, um, a need to protect civilians and to promote peace and stability for those who are in the need. Especially China's efforts in, in eliminate extreme poverty and, and fulfill the SDG agenda, number one agenda, 10 years ahead of the schedule of the UN, actually renewed hope actually for other developing countries. Further, China has taken strong support of the South-South cooperation for, the, for, the, for many developing countries and also to the UN to, in, to ensure the inclusive growth and prosperity for all. So in July this year, China issued a China VNR report on implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, sticking to the path of implementing the SDGs as well. Last month, during the UN Biodiversity Conference COP15 in Kunming, China has pledged again uh, 1.5 uh, billion RMB, which is 230 million US dollars, in support of the biodiversity protection in developing countries and successfully push forward for the Kunming Declaration. As we embark on the next journey, I sincerely hope that the future of China and the UN will be one of the concrete actions and greater openness to deliver more networked multilateralism and promote inclusive growth for all the member states of the UN. CCG and UN, actually, the UN agency in China have also in, embraced a great friendship and built a strong support for many years. We really appreciate the support and the cooperation from UN China. Together, we have co-organized a great number of events in the past, including CCG Annual China Globalization Forum, Annual China Inbound Outbound Forum, and other seminars and roundtables in, involving the topics of global governance and sustainable development, including the Silk Spice Roads Dialogue and Himalaya Consensus Dialogue. 
as the only think tank actually in China has been granted a special consultant status by the UN. Uh, we are really extremely honored to work with, uh, with UN. And of course, I know that uh, Ambassador Wu used to be the uh, <laughs> Under Secretary General of, of, of UN. Actually, he, he's in charge of uh, uh, ACOSO, and we are being uh, granted this status by the ACOSO. Uh, actually, it also helps us to promote cooperation between China and the UN family. So, CCG has uh, been actively engaging, conducting multilateral research, advancing the multilateral activities, and also to promoting the uh, multilateralism that, and also under the UN uh, Charter and UN multilateral spirit. So faced with unprecedented challenges and the changes in today's world, owing to the pandemic, climate change, widening inequalities, the rise of a populism, anti-globalization, the reintegration of multilateralism, and also upgrade of UN is really needed. So. I really hope that uh, China and the UN are, are the front at front forefront of this endeavor. It is our earnest hope that uh, the friendship between China and the UN would continue very ever strong, and the bond between CCG and the UN will, will endure, and also the multilateralism will flourish. So I really wish our afternoon discussion a, a complete success. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Wang. We are very honored to have four very distinguished guest speakers today. With honor, please allow me to present our first keynote speaker, Ambassador Wu Hongbo. Mr. Wu Hongbo is now special representative of the Chinese government on European affairs. Before that, he was appointed United Nations Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs in 2012. Prior to his appointment, Mr. Wu served as Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the People's Republic of China to the Federal Republic of Germany. Among his various diplomatic assignments, Mr. Wu serves as China's Ambassador to the Philippines. Please join me in welcoming our honored guest speaker, Special Representative of Chinese Government on European Affairs, His Excellency Ambassador Wu Hongbo. Your Excellency, Mr. Chatterjee, Resident Coordinator of the United Nations in China, Founder President of CCG, Ms. Wang Huiyao, dear ambassadors, dear UN colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In 1987, the 42nd UN General Assembly endorsed an important document called Our Common Future, also known as Bluntland Report. It defined for the first time in history the sustainable development. It says the development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This definition is of far-reaching significance. Ever since then, the international community has been working actively to enrich the content of a sustainable development with enormous outreach efforts. 28 years later, th this is a photo I took, the United Nations reached two important landmark agreements in 2015. 
namely the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement for Climate Change. In the Agenda 2030, the United Nations further defines the sustainable development as the development with the combination of economic growth, social justice, and the environmental protection. This is very important. And I'm so pleased as a former UN, uh, UN official and the former ambassador to see that the sustainable development is now enjoying increasing and the widespread popular support. Ladies and gentlemen, as Mr. Chatterjee mentioned, this year is really extraordinary for our Chinese people. It marks the centennial of the Communist Party of China and it celebrates the 50th anniversary of the restoration of People's Republic of China's lawful seats in the United Nations. Over the past 50 years, China has successfully moved from a poor country to the world's second largest economy. China has been sharing COVID response experience with the rest of the world, well sent large quantity of supplies, vaccines, and medicines to other countries. China also successfully met the UN Millennium Development Goals. The Chinese people, as mentioned before, now enjoyed moderately prosperous living standards with the unprecedented eradication of poverty in China this year. China has reached SDG 1, 10 years ahead of schedule, thus contributed over 70% of the global poverty eradication. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now China has become a very important country in the world as Under Secretary General, uh, as Secretary General Antonio Guterres said just recently, in the decades since, China has become an increasingly important contributor to the work of the organization and a major pillar of international cooperation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 is threatening all of us, our health, destroying our economies and livelihoods, and deepening poverty and inequalities. Thus, the virus is threatening our very existence. This is a very sad picture. COVID-19 pandemic has pushed 70 million people back to the extreme poverty and added 83 million more to the hungry population, making SDG 1 of eradicating poverty and SDG 2 of ending hunger far more difficult to reach. This is not a sad picture. 2,500 billionaires in the world have their combined wealth increased daily by $5.2 billion, while 4 billion people in the world have not even basic form 
of social security. 7.6 million people are displaced either by conflicts or by crisis. A lot of smoke. The density of carbon dioxide is 148 times higher than the pre-industrial level. One billion species in the world are in danger of extinction, while 10 million hectares of forests are lost every year. We are now, ladies and gentlemen, on the fringe, fringes of disaster. And the window of our hope is closing on us very fast. Ladies and gentlemen, our organizers or co-organizers have rightly chosen the two topics, the common prosperity and the climate change as the main subjects for today's roundtable discussions. I shall leave all these subjects to our panelists for their valuable opinions and expert advices. As a former UN Undersecretary General, personally involved in the formulation of SDGs, I wish to share with you my observations on the governance in implementing the sustainable development. Point number one, political will. The will must be people-oriented. We have witnessed too many cases where political functions, factions, interests prevail over the interests of a general public. Recently, Federal Reserve reported that the combined wealth of the super rich counting for only 1% of the US population surpassed for the first time the total wealth of the entire middle class families in the country. It's alarming. When you read this piece of information, you would understand the significance of a people-centric concept. Second point is, this will should remain unchanged despite the change of governments. The recent change of US governments is case in point. We all know how much damage could be done to SDG implementation and the climate change efforts. Two, organization. Point number one, localization. SDGs, although internationally agreed, are not, are emphasized are not, legally binding. Therefore, they should be incorporated into the national development strategies for better implementation. In 2015, soon after the United Nations endorsed the Agenda 2030, President Xi in New York publicly announced that China will incorporate all the SDGs, the 17 goals, into China's 13th five-year plan. Second, cross-cutting. All SDGs are all cross-cutting in nature. 
Therefore, they called for transministerial coordination. China had put in place a cross-sector mechanism composed of 47 ministries for SDG implementation in China, starting from 2016. Third minor point is field operation. The Chinese government sent 250,000 task teams with 5 million officials village relief operation. As we know, by the end of last year, nearly 100 million people in poverty has been helped. Now they have been helped out of poverty successfully. Three, accountability. This is another photo I took in Guizhou. This shows the river chief system. You have detailed responsibilities. Now, the third point I would like to address is accountability. Two minor points. One is division of responsibilities. All Chinese government officials and agencies have their specific responsibilities. In addition, China also invented, invented river and lake chief systems to ensure all river and lakes are under supervision and well managed. The second point is disciplinary sanctions. Those failing to perform their duties shall be disciplined accordingly. Since the Delta variant broke out, China had more than 100 officials accountable for neglecting their duties, and no patients died. Well, in another developed country, which is very large, none in default is held accountable more than 50,000 patients died. The sharp difference is obvious. The key word is accountability. Number four, data and indicators. The basic data is what we need to start with. At this moment in the world, more than 100 countries have no accurate birth and death registration. And over 77 countries have no sufficient information on poverty. We can see very clearly, without basic data, there will be no SDGs. Second, disaggregated data. This is a highly necessary if we want to have a focused relief efforts. I, I talked to some ambassadors in the United Nations who are from developed countries. They say the disaggregated information, even for us, are very, very challenging because that require uh, human resources and also uh, money for doing so. Now, China has both complete the basic data and disaggregated information for both SDG information and climate change actions. Number three, indicators. We all know the Agenda 2030 has 17 goals, 169 targets, and 231 indicators. As the senior official involved in the preparations, I know the UN indicators designed to 
cater for all circumstances. They are general in nature. So they need to be strengthened with the local indicators. For example, SDG 1, to end extreme poverty. The measurement for extreme poverty in SDG 1 is that the daily consumption, if your daily consumption is less than $1.25, then you are in extreme poverty. Now, this bar has been raised to $1.90, $1.90. But this is simply for each and every country. But in China, it's, it's a different story altogether. Uh, I think some of you are familiar. We have famous two not worries, three guarantees. Not worries means you are not going to worry about your food and the clothing. Three guarantees means your basic education medical care and the housing are guaranteed for you and your family members. So it is obvious. When we look at the Chinese indicators, we will see these are more specific and the practical with the standards are obviously higher than the UN indicators. Now, financing, this is a very important. When we talk about uh, doing something, you will have a lot of people say, that's a wonderful idea, but where is the money? This is a really a question frequently asked in developing countries, even in the rich countries. So, yeah. let me say, this is a really this. question Frequently asked First, in developing fully countries. Fully mobilization. Even in the rich in the United countries. United Nations, we've identified seven so areas. These could provide sort of a financial support to the SDGs. United Nations, I will not we've identified, identified seven so areas. These will include developing the cooperation, private business finance, sort of a and technology and capacity building to the SDGs. And so on. I will not identified um, seven in the areas. Eight years, the, business finance. the Chinese government alone, only government, earmarked $25.3 billion US for poverty relief, created 14,000 large enterprises, and organized 719,000 farmers co-ops. All these benefit 72% of the poor families in China. And second is innovation. Conventional financing is good, but it's not enough. So innovation is necessary. In China, public and the private enterprises, NGOs, are all fully mobilized to help. Poor people are helped with the vocational education and the professional training, small amounts of relief loans, e-commerce, tourism, and deforestation. For example, the government helped to build PV power stations. They have built such power stations in 100,000 poor villages. So each power station would bring, say, 30,000 US dollars annually to the poor fam to poor, the poor village. 30,000 dollars US on average. Then the money could be used to create new jobs. For instance, forest rangers to look after the forests, or the street cleaners, or to subsidize the poor families. And e-commerce. We know China is pretty strong in e-commerce. Now, e-commerce has covered all 832 poor counties 
to boost the local economy. So this is where the money comes from. In short, we need people-centered and efficient governance for both implementing SDGs and stopping global warming. As the president, she said in St. Petersburg, Russia, the sustainable development is the golden key to the solutions of our current global challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, let us work together for global sustainable development for both our generation and our generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Wu, for your very emphatic presentation. Uh, next, we'll welcome our second keynote speaker, Ambassador Rahmatella Osman, permanent representative of the African Union to China. Ambassador Osman was appointed as the permanent representative of the African Union to China. <coughs> In 2018, Ambassador Osman has occupied senior governmental positions in a career that spans over 40 years. Most recently, he served as the permanent representative of Sudan to the United Nations, where he closely followed the activities of the African group in New York, which resulted in the integration of the common African position into the Sustainable Development Goals. Without further ado, please welcome His Excellency Ambassador Rahmatella Mohamed Osman for special address. Excellencies, distinguished guests, all titles observed. I wish at the beginning to thank the organizers of this event for having invited the African Union mission to participate in this seminar of celebration of the 50th anniversary of the restoration of the lawful seat of China in the United Nations, as well as for allowing me to share my reviews of the China's journey back to the United Nations and its contribution to its causes. As the, lar as the largest developing country and a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, China always embraced the principles and ideals of the United Nations by contributing to humanity's cause of peace, stability, and development, and promoting with concrete actions a community with a shared future for mankind. You would recall, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that in 1971, African countries provided a crucial majority which ensured the joining of China to the United Nations and also allowing it to take its lawful seat on the United Nations Security Council as one of the five permanent members. Since then, an unbreakable bond between China and Africa was forged. This bond was testified by the leadership of China in supporting African countries in their fight for national independence and liberation against colonialism, apartheid, segregationist regimes, which laid a solid foundation for long-term friendship and cooperation with African countries. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, China as a founding member of the United Nations and the fairest country to sign the United Nations Charter has made tangible contributions to the United Nations, especially in global governance, peacekeeping, and poverty reduction and development. Over the years, China steadily supported multilateralism and the work to improve global governance and international development cooperation, including safeguard of the international system within, with the United Nations at its core, as China continued 
to adherence to the universal values of humanity, peace, development, equality, equity, justice, democracy, and freedom. And the world. In recent years, in particular, China has taken an active role in United Nations peacekeeping operations based. For instance, in December 2018, China's large is large is a large United Nations peacekeeping budget for 2019 and 2021 was raised from 10.24% 10 to 15.22%, making it the second largest contributor only after the United States of America. China has also dispatched more than 40,000 peacekeepers to over 30 countries, contributing more peacekeepers than any other permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. The China's active role in peacekeeping has a special meaning to Africa, since most of the United Nations peacekeeping missions currently deployed throughout the world to are in Africa. The continued support to Africa at various levels, including the contribution to the peacekeeping missions and the operationalization of Africa stand by force, as well as the work towards a better representation of Africa in the international system in the United Nations Security Council as part of a new global governance system continue to be a priority of China in recent engagement in the United Nations with a special emphasis on enhancing African capacities. These developments have also facilitated the strengthening of the partnership between the African Union and the United Nations based on the principles of mutual respect and African ownership. In fact, the African Union and the United Nations are actively implementing joint frameworks on peace and security and on sustainable development, including the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the African Union 2063 Agenda. Africa and China and the United Nations are also cooperating on a number of specific situations before the United Nations Security Council. Moreover, China plays a great role in the reform of the United Nations Security Council, in particular, the call for increasing representation and role for developing countries in the Council in order to enhance its authority and efficiency and to enable it to better fulfill the responsibilities maintaining international peace and security conferred on it by the United Nations Charter. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ending poverty by 2030 is at the heart of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. More recently, China achieved the goal of eliminating absolute poverty 10 years ahead, and it is planned to realize the goal established under the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. 99 million rural pe people living below the current poverty line were raised from poverty. These achievements have written a new chapter in the world's history, as China's contribution to the poverty reduction represent more than 70% of the global poverty reduction effort and has significantly reduced the world's impoverished population. The willingness of China to share the proceeds of its development passed with the rest of the developing world towards their economic and social development and people's well-being are a great contribution to global agenda on poverty eradication. As such, an understanding of China's experience of poverty reduction will provide a reference to other countries to fight against poverty, particularly those in South Asia and Africa, which have around 85% of the world's poor. As regards to Africa, the government of the, and the people of China have shown the world that they are still true partners of Africa through support to the continent's commitment to its own path of growth and development. In particular, the commitments made to help Africa in the implementation of Agenda 2063 
and the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda, which will steadily reinforce the African capacities to fight against poverty and towards the continent development. China also is in the front line in the promotion of South-South cooperation. In particular, the Africa-China cooperation through the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC, and the Belt and Road Initiative, covering a range of areas such as industrialization, agricultural modernization, infrastructure, finance, green development, trade and investment facilitation, poverty reduction, public health, cultural and people-to-people -people exchange, and peace and security testify that South-South cooperation can respond to development needs of our continent. Equally, in the face of COVID-19, China has actively responded to the United Nations initiated Global Humanitarian Response Plan, a cash donation of 50 million US dollars to the World Health Organization, assistance in kind and over 150 countries and international organizations and medical exports to more than 2,200 countries and regions. African nations have also benefited from the China support in fighting against COVID-19 pandemic in the improving of their public health systems, fortifying their public health defenses and improve the speed of their response to their capacity for disease control through establishing a cooperation mechanism such as the pair up with African hospitals and acceleration of the construction of the health infrastructures in the continent. China has further committed to make COVID-19 vaccines available as a global public good for Africa. As such, I wish to conclude by reiterating that the African Union will remain China's strategic and long-standing partner as we jointly pursue common development goals based on mutual respect, good faith, shared interest, and practical results. I sincerely hope that the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the restoration of the lawful seat of China in the United Nations would provide an opportunity to renew China's commitment with multilateralism, partnership, and cooperation towards world peace, stability, and development. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Ambassador Osman. Voice from South is so very important. Next, very honored and pleased to introduce His Excellency Ambassador Mamadou Njaya from Senegal. Ambassador Njaya is the co-chair of the upcoming 2021 Forum on China-Africa Cooperation for CAC. Having joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Senegal in 2000, he held various positions being consecutively officer in charge, Asian Affairs, Counselor at the Embassy of Senegal in Japan, Director for African and Asian Affairs, Minister Counselor at the Embassy of Senegal to Canada, and uh, Ambassador to the Republic of Korea from 2013 until his appointment to China in 2017. Ambassador Giles, civil plan. Excellencies, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed, good afternoon. We are gathered uh, here today to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the restoration of the lawful seat of the People's Republic of China in the United Nations. In doing so, we also recognize and celebrate China's outstanding role in the United Nations and its uh, sterling contribution to international development. Over the past uh, 50 years, China, as a responsible member of the international community, has been striving to safeguard the values and principles of the United Nations. China has also continued to be at the forefront of all major global initiatives aimed at making this world a better place to live in. 
One of its major contributions is undoubtedly its precious support to the African countries' efforts to fight against poverty and to achieve development and prosperity. Through various mechanisms, China's development cooperation has constantly been present in Africa, where it has played a major role in the economic and social development of many countries and brought tremendous changes to the living conditions of the population. For instance, it is thanks to China-Africa cooperation that many African countries that in many, the, my, many African countries have seen a sharp increase in the number of their citizens who now have access to essential infrastructure like roads, electricity, drinking water, sc schools and hospitals. Capacity building and human resources training are also two areas where China-Africa cooperation has made significant strides with China offering wide-ranging training opportunities to African students and civil servants. Most importantly, Africa has learned from China's development trajectory and rapid transformation the lesson that uh, poverty is not a fate and it can be eliminated. Since the establishment of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC, in the year 2000, China-Africa Cooperation has given new impetus to South-South Cooperation. Based on principles such as inter alia equality, mutual respect, and mutual benefits, China has expanded China, FOCAC has expanded China-Africa Cooperation to new domains and demonstrated that the potential for, of international development cooperation is far from being exhausted. As we prepare for the eighth ministerial conference of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation to be held later this month in Dakar, Senegal, we are confident that FOCAC will remain true to its reputation as a win-win partnership and a pragmatic cooperation platform. In this regard, it is important to build a synergy between FOCAC, the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, Agenda, Agenda 2063 of the African Union, and the national development strategies of China and the African countries. This was a commitment made at the 2018 Beijing Summit, and it would be pertinent to enhance it at this crucial moment when the world is facing unprecedented challenges in, related, in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. In particular, after 20 year, 21 years of existence, FOCAC must demonstrate that it's possible to unlock the potential of African countries and to develop the continent by uh, leveraging on international cooperation, which can be supplemented by a greater participation from the private sector. For this to be achieved, it is essential to invest in building in Africa an ecosystem of knowledge development that is conducive to sustainable economic and social transformation. With an extremely young population projected to reach 2.5 billion in 2050, Africa is today the world's largest reservoir of human capital and prospective talents. These young men and women are Africa's most precious assets. If provided with appropriate education and training, they can become the next generation of skilled workers, managers, engineers, and entrepreneurs who will scale up the productive capacity, capacities of their countries and turn Africa into an industrial and economic powerhouse. Having successfully made the journey from 
poverty to prosperity, China is most qualified to be the strategic partner of the African countries at a time when Africa is resolutely determined to change the course of its history as epitomized by the implementation of the African Union's Agenda 2063. In this regard, I strongly believe that the United Nations can provide precious guidance and coordination to Africa and China so as to ensure a better planning of their cooperation within the FOCAC framework. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate my warm congratulations to China on this 50th anniversary, and I wish the Chinese people continued peace and happiness. I also thank the, the Office of the UN Resident Coordinator in China and the Center for China and Globalization for giving me this opportunity to speak at this very important event. Thank you for your kind attention. Merci beaucoup, um, Ambassador Jair. Um, with much anticipation, allow me to present our last keynote speaker, Mr. Tianling, Director General of the Department of International Cooperation and Spokesperson of China International Development Cooperation Agency. DG Tian joined Foreign Service in 1995 and served in the Department of African Affairs of Ministry of Foreign Affairs of China and Chinese Embassy in Nigeria. He was the counselor of the Chinese permanent mission to the United Nations and alternate representative of China to the UN Security Council from 2011 to 2013, the counselor and deputy chief of mission of Chinese Embassy in Kenya from 2013 to 2015, the Counselor of the Department of International Organizations and Conferences of MFA of China from 2015 up to 2018. He took the current position since 2018. DG Tianling, please. Excellencies, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the restoration of lawful seat of the People's Republic of China at the United Nations, it is my pleasure on behalf of the China International Development Cooperation Agency and Chairman Luo Zhaohui to attend this forum China and the United Nations 50 years and beyond. Please allow me to extend my warm congratulations on the opening of this symposium. My sincere thanks will also go to our hosts, UN in China and the CCG for your thoughtful arrangements. Ladies and gentlemen, 50 years ago, the People's Republic of China and the United Nations joined hands together and opened a new era in our relations. Over the past 50 years, China has faithfully followed the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter and has become an important builder of world peace, a contributor to global development and a defender of international order. In, pro in promoting the noble cause of global sustainable development, China and the United Nations have worked hand in hand, becoming important partners. China spares no effort to realize the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development we have actively implemented the new philosophy of innovative, coordinated, green, open, and shared development. Historically solved the problem of absolute poverty and built the largest social security and compulsory education system in the world. We have taken the lead in both 
pandemic prevention and control, and the economic recovery. Becoming the only major economy that have achieved the positive economic growth last year. China's success has set a model for global poverty eradication, pandemic and sustainable development, and has enhanced the confidence and strengths of developing countries. China actively leads the global governance on international development governance. President Xi Jinping recently proposed the Global Development Initiative, calling for adhering to the concept of prioritizing development and being people-centered, promoting global development to a new stage of balance, coordination, and inclusiveness, and providing China solutions to the world at the crossroads of the history. The initiative is open to the world, and we welcome the participation of all parties. China actively promotes the common development of the world. We formed an accurate synergy between China's foreign aid and other countries' development strategies, provided them with timely assistance, shared our development experience, and without any political conditions. We actively promoted the joint construction of high-quality Belt and Road Initiative, building the widest and largest Inter in international cooperation platform in the world and advanced against the impact of COVID-19. We have provided foreign assistance to more than 160 countries in the world, implemented thousands of complete and material assistance projects, 10,000 of technical and human resources cooperation projects, and have trained about 400,000 personnel of all kinds in developing countries. China actively responds to global humanitarian crisis. We have never been absent from global humanitarian crisis such as public health crisis, Natural, disasters, and following the outbreak of COVID-19, we launched the largest emergency humanitarian operation since the founding of the People's Republic of China have provided anti-pandemic material assistance to 150 countries and 13 international organizations and have sent 37 medical expert teams to 34 countries this year. We have been actively implemented the solemn commitment by President Xi Jinping to make China's vaccine a global public good providing over 1.6 billion doses of vaccines to more than 100 countries and international organizations, and playing a crucial role in the global cooperation against the pandemic. China actively advocates multilateral cooperation. We have established the South-South Cooperation Assistance Fund, cooperated with more than 10 United Nations agencies, and implemented more than 100 livelihood projects in over 50 countries to the benefit of more than 20 million people. We have set up the Institute of South-South Cooperation and Development to share our exp uh, uh, development experience 
and build a platform for research and exchange. We have established also the China UN Peace and Development Fund, providing support to more than 100 developing countries. Recently, China has successfully sponsored the China COP15 UN and the second United Nations Global Sustainable Transport Conference. Ladies and gentlemen, the world today is under the combined impacts of the pandemic and worldwide changes, both unseen in the century. We are facing challenges that emerge one after another. Implementing this 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is the core task for current international development cooperation. As the most universal, representative and authoritative intergovernmental international organization, the United Nations should hold high the banner of true multilateralism and become the core platform for all countries to jointly safeguard universal security, shared development experience, and jointly grasp the destiny of the world. China will work closely together with the United Nations to meet the challenges and advance the course of human development. We will fully support international cooperation in fighting the pandemic. We will continue to provide vaccines and necessary anti-pandemic supplies to countries in urgent need. Continue to carry out medical and technical cooperation, helping developing countries better their public health systems improve the level of international public health and provide support for recipient countries to accelerate their economic and social recovery. We will continue to implement the goal of green development. We will engage in in-depth cooperation projects to deal with climate change, increase support for clean energy projects shared green development experience and jointly construct the Silk Road of green development. We will assist the recipient countries in building a resourcing saving and environmental friendly society and constructing a community of shared future for mankind and nature. We will actively support global economic recovery we will continue to pay close attention to the fundamental human rights of survival and development in all countries. Focuses on the array of livelihood issues such as poverty, unemployment, hunger, health, and education. Consistently increase the supply of public good and actively ensure the safety and stability of industrial chain and supply chain. We will continue to optimize global development governance. We will actively participate in dialogue and cooperation in the field of development, strengthen exchanges and mutual learning between China and various assistance providers, increase support for international organizations help developing countries remove developmental bottleneck and make new contributions to building a community of shared future for mankind. China's foreign aid and international development cooperation will continue to play an important role in the promotion of the common development of the world. Guided by the Xi Jinping sword on diplomacy, our mission will be the construction of a common community of shared future for mankind. Our principle will be the right approach to justice and interests. We will take into account both bilateral and multilateral assistance and combine hard aid together with 
soft aid so as to build an all-round and multi-dimensional pattern of China's foreign aid. We will continue to strengthen our exchange and cooperation with the traditional donors, the United Nations, and other international organizations. While also acting for triangular cooperation, we will strengthen the whole chain supervision, prevent corruption, improve with the traditional policy. donors, enhance evaluation, thereby ensuring the sustainable development of China's foreign aid projects. We will continue to release through different channels the information and data of China's foreign aid timely to improve transparency. Ladies and gentlemen, regardless of international changing circumstances, China will always remain a staunch supporter of the United Nations and multilateralism, a staunch promoter of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and a staunch practitioner of the course of international development cooperation. We firmly believe that the multilateral system centered on the United Nations will be strengthened at a higher level in a wider scope and across a wider field. And that great glory will be achieved in the undertaking of the development and progress of mankind. I thank you. Thank you, DG Tianling, for bringing us excellent perspectives from uh, SITCA. Uh, while we conclude the opening keynote session, um, shall we invite all our roundtable participants up to the front area for a group photo? Um, distinguished speakers, please don't be shy. Please, we invite all participants. Uh, our colleague, please assist Mr. Andy Mock.
moderator of our first discussion towards a new development model for common prosperity over to you and the great thank you very much again your excellencies distinguished guest ladies and gentlemen here at CCG and watching us online poverty like illness and inequality is as old as mankind itself but because of advances in social awareness political institutions including those at the global level and technology we are at a unique point in human history where extreme poverty at least may be eradicated in terms of numbers it's estimated that 10 percent of the world's population or about 700 million people still suffer from extreme poverty which the un defines as a condition characterized by severe deprivation deprivation of basic human needs including food safe drinking water sanitation facilities health shelter education and information it depends not only on income but also access to services we can also define extreme poverty as living on less than two dollars a day as we heard earlier uh, in this event the decline in extreme or absolute poverty has been a cause for celebration with the global poverty rate falling from 80% in the year 1800 to 10% today. Moreover, in what would have been unimaginable 50 years ago when it regained its lawful seat at the United Nations, China has led the way by eliminating poverty within its borders. This decade is a crucial one for a number of global development goals as outlined in the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Of these 17 goals, the first is eliminating poverty. Because once this is achieved, many of the other goals will follow. However, this task is not so simple. While China's economic growth has been nothing short of miraculous, it has not been without cost, including to the environment, and increases in societal inequality. But there is cause for hope and even a degree of optimism for both China and the world. According to Professor Li Xiaoxi, a member of CCG's Academic Council and selected by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences as one of the 100 economists who influenced China's economic development, which he discusses in his book green civilization, which you all have a copy of here, um, that adopting a holistic approach that explicitly considers and makes central the relationship of humans, society, and nature can provide a sustainable path forward that is inclusive of all the world's religions and belief systems. Similarly, China's goal or program of common prosperity is about more than just material progress, but also incorporates an emphasis on cultural and spiritual prosperity that is informed by traditional Chinese philosophy and socialism, as well as a market orientation. Only by such a holistic and integrated approach as detailed in Professor Lee's book, can the scourge of extreme poverty be overcome. Today, we are fortunate to have a panel that possesses a broad range of disciplines and geographical expertise, which reflects this holistic approach to discuss how the goal of reducing poverty and inequality globally can be better achieved. My name is Andy Bach, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. I'm also on television at China Global Television Network, Al Jazeera, and other global media platforms, where I discuss technology and its impact on international relations. Uh, I'm really delighted and honored to have such a distinguished and experienced panel today. And with their permission, uh, I will avoid a lengthy, detailed uh, introduction and let them uh, share aspects of their background that they believe would be most relevant to a productive and fruitful conversation today. And in terms of housekeeping, uh, we ask or I ask that uh, you keep your interventions to about five minutes and we will have ample time for Q&A and further elaboration. And we will go for the entire uh, 60 minutes that have been scheduled. So let me start uh, 
with uh, the uh, distinguished woman to my right, uh, Cynthia McCaffrey, who is with UNICEF. Great. Thank you, Andy. And my name is Cynthia McCaffrey. I work for the United Nations Children's Fund. And so for about 20 years, I've had the privilege of working with um, UN colleagues to advance and protect the rights of children. Um, I just also want to echo the thanks to Dr. Wong and his team at CCG and to our resident coordinator, Chatterjee, and his team for convening and bringing us together for the opportunity to talk about the incredible commitment that China has made to multilateral co cooperation and the power of that collaboration to have an impact on lives. I want to compliment um, the august history that we've been talking about with some additional history. Uh, UNICEF, like a number of our sister agencies, has been working in China for over 40 years. And UNICEF, like them, is very proud of the 42 years of working with the government of China because of the accomplishments that we've been able to support in China's protecting and realizing the rights of all her children. In addition, a number of us are celebrating 75 years. So like a number of other UN agencies, UNICEF was created by member states. So for 75 years, UNICEF has been working to implement that mandate given by member states to, imp to protect and advance the rights of children all over the world. I bring that up because Dr. Wong reminded me when his friend said that the UN Charter is a, a beautiful document. Um, that's the document on which all of our work is based, and it's also a timeless document. So the world changes, things have gone up and down recently in the last few years, but especially since we were founded in 75 years ago, and yet, the words of the charter are timeless. And so much so that member states have reiterated them by creating and codifying the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which came into effect at the end of the 1980s, 1989. And the government of China was an early signer and ratifier. And it picks up on those principles of rights and protecting children's rights in particular, because how timeless they are. I bring that up in that history and that foundation because it's a roadmap for how we try to move forward with that common understanding to put in place the right programs and policies, guidelines, in order to truly realize every single child's right and protect and advance those rights. And it holds us all to account in all sectors. It's up to governments, but I would call on the private sector. It holds to account communities it holds to account parents and children themselves understanding their rights. So these are very lofty goals and UN, you'll hear all of us talking about these big words of rights and protecting and advancing them, but what does it mean? How does it manifest? Three things that I'd like to leave all of us with that gives an example of work UNICEF has done around the world, but including here with the government of China. The first is equal access to quality services. And let me emphasize, again, this is where the roadmap comes in. The government of China and UNICEF is not working on creating quality services for services sake, but in order to advance and protect the rights of children. So for example, over the last 40 years, China has implemented a strong health system so that we have seen the elimination of children dying from preventable causes. And that's because China has created a universal immunization. By the beginning of the 1990s, all of China's children were immunized against major killers such as DPT and measles. Secondly, I would challenge anyone who is familiar with iodine deficiency disorder because China in the last 40 years has eliminated this disorder. And that was because it put in, in place a strong health system, a health system that had equal access and the highest possible quality for everyone, and especially the most vulnerable populations. The second way we use this guidance of the UN Charter and the Convention on the Rights of the Child is to have equal access for all children to the benefit of social security, the benefits that come from that. That you can see in Article 26 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. 
Now we forgot to bring our conventions on the rights to the child, but we can get you copies in both Mandarin and English. Just come see me after this. But the idea there is to integrate the financial investment with the services that we're providing to children. So a very tangible example is the government of China's investing in social work. In 2010, based on lessons and ideas that UNICEF had from around the world and the needs that the government of China had identified, China in 120 villages implemented frontline training to build capacity of social workers, what we call child directors. Today, the government of China has expanded that to over 660,000 villages with people on the front line with the tools and the skills to identify children at risk and to identify when children are already at risk how to help them. We continue to work on ways to strengthen that system. The third area of how we manifest these documents and these lofty words into action is investing in the entire childhood from the earliest days all the way through adolescence. One of the things that we know is that the brain, by the age of three, has developed to 80% of its adult capacity. So that means an investment in those early childhood days is extremely important. And that means that we've worked with the government of China to work on how do we invest in those systems that create early childhood investment in nutrition, in health, in education. And the government of China has done that by building systems on the front lines with health, education, but positive parenting with caregivers. Just in 2021, recently, one of our early childhood development pi pilots was given the best practice in poverty reduction for, from the Global Rural Development Forum. So, that's an independent review that that kind of investment in early childhood development is working. The government of China has also committed in the whole childhood, adolescence. That is the second time the brain develops at such a rapid pace. And so UNICEF is working with the government of China to continue investing in systems of education and learning that go beyond middle school but into high school and create rigorous and robust opportunities in vocational training so that we're looking at the whole child from that early three years old, zero to three, zero to six, all the way through adolescence. Let me end by saying that we've taken these lessons across China and over the 40 years, I know our organization and others have applied the lessons learned. We've brought in ideas from outside of China and we're bringing the lessons that we're learning as DG Tianlin said, outside of China. The South-South Cooperation Assistance Fund has enabled UNICEF to work with countries around the world to respond to cyclone emergencies, for example, with the SCAF funding from SITCA and CSET, th th those countries were able to get rapid assistance. And we want to continue to do that South-South back and forth across China, into China, and out of China. With that, Andy, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So that sounds to me like a compelling case study of what uh, resident coordinator Chatterjee said about the UN marching in lockstep with China and His Excellency Wu Hongbo talking about a people-oriented philosophy combined with effective and efficient governance. Thank you very much for that, Cynthia. Um, so now we will have Shabazz Khan, who is the director of UNESCO Cluster Office in Beijing. And if you're not familiar with what UNESCO stands for, it's the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organizations. And I believe that Shabazz will talk about that as well as perhaps some scientific technological issues as well. Thank you, Shabazz. Thank you very much, dear Andy. Uh, the question which has been put to the round table is a very interesting one, the new development model. China joined UNESCO on the 4th of November, 1946. So very important milestone. And the UNESCO office in Beijing was established in 1984. So it's a very, very long-term partnership. And in the process, uh, many things have been learned together. 
And uh, there are so many uh, things which are now coming from China to the world. I would like to take this new development model with the three important pillars which all of us know, Chinese policy we have heard today. Rural revitalization, ecological civilization, and shared prosperity. For rural revitalization, and of course we are guided by the UNSDCF under the leadership of SID as uh, the one UN working together. Very importantly, first of all in education, technical and vocational education is a very important part of China's progress. We have several UNIVOC centers um, where we are working uh, both with the rural communities but also technical vocational education from China coming to the world. And now, very importantly, green skills which are needed. And uh, uh, many people have their estimates. We need millions of people with green skills, more than 80 million people, uh, who can uh, do green transformation. Also, communities of learning, CLCs. This is a very important work of UNESCO, working with rural communities. And how can we take from poverty alleviation to the next? UNESCO is also very special in area of culture. And I'm sure in China, wherever I go, I'm so pleased to know that Chinese people love UNESCO because they know World Heritage Sites. 56 World Heritage Sites, only one below Italy. Next year, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the World Heritage Sites in China are very, very special, 56 of them. And I'm sure uh, if you have not visited, go and visit all of them. The latest one is Zhangzhou in Fujian province. Very, very beautiful. But these are not just the places of beauty. These are the places of new sustainable development. And that's where I would like to draw your attention. Of course, in Beijing, you have wonderful world heritage. Uh, you have the Forbidden City. You have uh, uh, the Temple of Heaven, among many others. So these are amazing places which can create new opportunities for sustainable development, rural revitalization, for that, we need new skills as well. And China has, uh, after the 44th extended session of the World Heritage Committee in July in Fuzhou, has established an online platform for heritage education to help the world. So this is a new model. Also, intangible heritage in China is very special. So what is intangible heritage? Like the solar calendar, very special like the special kind of dances we have, the special kind of embroidery we have, the silver we have. So intangible heritage is very big in China, and we have special centers in China. Like I just want to give you one example, World Heritage Training and Research Institute for Asia and Pacific. This special center, what we call WITRAP, is helping African World Heritage Fund under the leadership of UNESCO to bring these skills to the world. So rural revitalization, education, technical vocation education, and then also very importantly linking with culture. Let me very quickly move to the ecological civilization, also a new model of President Xi Jinping. And in the ecological civilization, very important is how do we move from the business as usual to a better coexistence between nature and humans. And that's where UNESCO has 34 biosphere reserves in China. And those biosphere reserves are very special. Like Wulong, that's where we have pandas. That's also a world heritage, natural heritage site. We have taken panda out of in danger to vulnerable. Very big achievement. Also, uh, we have Henan Gibbons, very special. We have Siberian tigers, very special. But now it's not about the survival of the species, but how do we create new ecosystems and new rural livelihoods so that there is a new model for development? It was mentioned in the opening, the river chiefs system. UNESCO have the intergovernmental hydrological program, very active in China, working with the Yellow River as well as with the Yangtze and among others. I've been to many of the cities, including Guiyang recently. Guizhou province, that's where the river chief system was shown. Hongfeng Lake is a lake which supplies water to the whole of uh, uh, the Guiyang city. Excellent example of river chiefs working together from a very degraded river system and uh, lake system. Now it is a UNESCO reference site which will help others. Let me also quickly go to another area, shared prosperity. So now we have 56 World Heritage Sites, 34 Biosphere Reserves, 
We have 41 UNESCO Global Geoparks. So these, along with President Xi Jinping's ecological civilization, shared prosperity, people-to-people -people benefits, China is actively contributing through UNESCO centers and UNESCO chairs. We have a very special center about data with Chinese Academy of Sciences, which is helping all heritage sites in the world. So that's a very important example. So I'll give you another example. Um, from Hanzhou, we have a special UNESCO chair on entrepreneurship, which is helping bring new skills with the young people. The 2035 Education Modernization Plan of uh, China, and uh, that's where UNESCO has some very special friendship with China and the work which is being done. Recently, I went to Chufu, the birthplace of Confucius. 2,572 years ago, Confucius gave the idea of education for all. And we have in UNESCO Confucius Literacy Prize. Every year we award. This year we awarded to Cote d'Ivoire, Mexico, and we also awarded it to Egypt. Uh, Her Excellency, the First Lady, has recently um, been uh, awarding the UNESCO Global Prize on girls' education and women's education. So very, very special. China has contributed hugely to South-South development with the China Great Wall Fellowship Program. People from all over the world have come here, and many of them are back. Very quickly, let me add a couple of more examples, and then I will pass on. Uh, we have uh, um, se several uh, of UNESCO centers, um, like the one in Shenzhen, it's about higher education and ICTs. Very important area, how we bring artificial intelligence, how we bring open science, new data, and modern classrooms. Western Africa has benefited from this partnership, and we have examples in Gambia, in Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, among many others. So overall, I would say over a period of time, our friendship and partnership with China has evolved where there are many more centers in the areas of science and technology contributing. Also, lastly, within the UN uh, thematic areas, uh, we have the result areas and thematic areas, and uh, Sumitri will talk about your, uh, women area. I would, very importantly, the people with disabilities, leaving no one behind. That's a very important area with 85 million people who have various forms of disability. China has been working very closely with the UN, including on the Special Olympics and other areas. So we have many examples, both within China, and how can we take it out to work with Belt and Road Initiative for shared prosperity and more people-to-people -people exchanges. So, dear Andy, I leave it here so that you can continue with your time scale. Great. Thank you very much, Savaz. So uh, now, next, we have Smriti Ariel, who is the head of office for UN Women in China. Smriti, please. Thank you, Andy. And good afternoon, um, all of you who are here, distinguished guests, and those joining us online. Um, I should also add to our colleagues that although we're not as old as UNICEF or UNESCO, uh, UN Women has been partnering with China since 1995. And I'm sure all of us know what happened in 1995. It was the historic event of the Fourth World Conference on Women, and which created and landed us with the blueprint for women's rights agenda globally, the Beijing Platform for Action. So we're really, really proud of our achievement. Then we were UNIFEM, I should add. Now we are UN Women uh, after the reform, several reform. And a lot has been accomplished and a lot of progress on women's rights had been made since then um, with China here in our partnership with the broader UN community, also with UN Women, and also with the support from China globally. And I believe as UN Women, this partnership is even more critical now um, as the world is struggling to recover from the pandemic impact. And then we know when we talk about pandemic, uh, the most uh, detrimental impact often is on women and girls. And I believe the topic today, the topic of how do we look at a new development model for common prosperity is a very important one linked to gender equality and women's empowerment. And I would like to highlight three considerations. The first one is empowering women in economy and closing the gender gap that we know in the world of work, I believe is a precondition to common prosperity agenda. Um, we know that when women work, 
It boosts productivity, efficiency, it increases economic diversification, of course increases income for women, the family, and also has a positive impact on the overall development of the country. But the reality is globally, the labor participation of women is at 63%, 64% compared to 94% for men. Um, women earn less and women are often less employed than men. And when, even when women are employed, they are more likely to be employed in a vulnerable and informal sector job. And we know the COVID pandemic has pushed 47 more million women into extreme poverty in 2021. And 54 million women lost job between 2019 and 2020. I know everybody spoke about the data, but I must say the impact on women is very, very severe. So the extent to which women's employment, wage, earnings, and wealth improves is debt -free, debt determinant of common prosperity. And in this regard, UN Women has been working with line ministries and with the government of China at the provincial level, at the national level, with Women's Federation, and many other partners, including private sector, to support government's effort in creating decent jobs, in improving and increasing entrepreneurship, and increasing access to market, and I'm sure my colleague may highlight an example of our work in Qinghai, and I like UNICEF. It was one of the projects that won an award at the uh, Global um, uh, Forum on Poverty Alleviation, or Rural Revitalization and Poverty Alleviation. But I believe, like my colleague from UNESCO pointed out, we need a special agenda, attention to educating, skilling, and upskilling women, especially to prepare them for the rapid technological and green transformation that is taking place within China. In the green sector, I believe the green sector alone will create 24 million jobs globally. And I think it's really, really important that we skill women, we support them through capacity building um, so that they can be uh, productive, they can increase their income, but also we promote their leadership and participation. I think China's commitment to carbon neutrality, green development, and rural revitalization, I believe this is really relevant. And I think it's a great opportunity also to shift women from primary industry, and that's where a lot of Chinese women are still concentrated, to secondary and tertiary, and increase labor participation and income. So that's number one. The number two area I would like to highlight is how do we look at expanding care services as a global public good? and increasing social security benefit to informal sector workers. The burden of care that women do is 3.5 more times more than men everywhere. And this is an undervalued public service that women do for free, unrecognized, and often cost us their own job, their life learning opportunity. UN Women's Global Analysis shows that enhancing public investment in care services through development of time-saving care infrastructure such as child care, elderly care facilities, and social security benefit, paid leave, standard ways, universal child care allowance, could increase up to 40 to 60 percent care jobs worldwide. Not only would, of course, this create decent jobs for those who are unemployment, unemployed, but also actually it would address the care deficit that exists in the world today. And I, I think the other point related to do is to also increase and enhance social security benefit to informal care workers, often the small scale farmers, the domestic workers, to stabilize their income and ensure greater resilience to future shocks and vulnerabilities. This could be a game changer for reducing inequalities, maximizing productivity, efficiency, and strengthening public service delivery, all of which are key elements of achieving common prosperity agenda highly relevant for China, as well as for the rest of the world. My final point is about investment, and I, we heard earlier speakers speak on development financing. Despite the significant link between investment for women and girls and the sustainable development, de development financing for gender equality, and specifically for SDG 5, is rather low. It's around 5% of the global ODA. Uh, yet, we know the needs are really, really widening, especially aftermath of the COVID pandemic. So how do we innovate public financing and fiscal policies to support the, jet, the gap we see at the national level is going to be very critical. The other is to boost public-private partnership 
encouraging industries and companies to play a greater role. In this regard, UN Women has been working with over 263 companies and firms to implement what we call the Women's Empowerment Principles, the WEPs, a standard for promoting responsible business practices and creating favorable environment for women and girls. The increasing number of Chinese companies with interest in corporate social responsibility for gender equality, I believe, is a huge opportunity for us to promote common prosperity agenda. More importantly, China's global footprint as the international development partner is ever increasing and gaining momentum, and we've heard plenty about that. And we really hope that China's recent commitment for prioritizing women's empowerment as one of the main areas of international cooperation will garner greater global solidarity and multilateral support to closing the gap in financing for gender equality everywhere. China's continued leadership and commitment for convergence of support and resources is really, really crucial at this stage. And we, we as UN Women, hope to work with China to promote women's rights, needs, and interests in other developing countries through South-South cooperation projects, technical exchange, think tanks like the one we are here today, and knowledge sharing. We also look forward to partnering with China for organizing the next Global Leaders Meeting in 2025 a commitment President Xi made at the high-level meeting marking the 25th anniversary of Beijing Platform for Action last year at the United Nations General Assembly in 2020. To conclude, China's achievements and progress provide valuable lesson for the world for global development. As UN Women and alongside our UN family, we are standing ready to support China to promote women's rights agenda through South-South cooperation and other normative processes while it's also offering the collective experiences, tools, and resources on gender equality from around the world to benefit China. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share, and thanks to CCG for co-hosting the event with the UN family. Xie Great. Thank you very much, sweetie. As we've heard so far from our panel uh, participants that the SDGs, Common Prosperity, are all interrelated, and by improving economic, the economic prospects for women, uh, increasing their education levels, everything from basic literacy to perhaps uh, commercial knowledge, uh, can uh, help the achievement of all of these objectives. Um, so I think it's very, very important uh, what we heard from Smriti as well as uh, Cynthia about children and women, and of course from Shabazz about education, ecological civilization, that all of these are connected. And this goes back, I think, to a Chinese concept as well of Ituobo Fun, or the one and the many are connected, meaning that we cannot really separate any of these issues looking at people, society, and nature. And of course, one very important part of this uh, will be uh, our last uh, speaker from the United Nations on this panel today, uh, Matteo Marchisio, who is the country director and representative in China, ROK, and DPRK for IFAD. And again, if you're not familiar with IFAD, stands for it's the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And I believe he will share uh, with us about not only what his organization is doing, but the importance of agriculture and development in rural areas. Absolutely, and uh, thank you very much, Andy, uh, for giving me the floor, and to CCG for inviting me to this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the uh, UN-China relationship, which incidentally are all, is also the, the 40th anniversary of IFA-China cooperation. Uh, 1981 was the year in which IFAD, which is uh, a UN agency, but also an international financing institution, provided its first uh, concessional loan to China uh, to, um, uh, to finance a project on rural development in Inner Mongolia. And uh, over the past 40 years, uh, uh, IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, has uh, supported China in its uh, effort to reduce uh, uh, poverty reduction uh, and develop rural areas. Uh, we have been working uh, in the most poor and remote areas, uh, uh, targeting, uh, working with the most uh, vulnerable segments of, uh, of the population, uh, um, um, rural farmers, smallholder farmers, uh, women, and uh, here is uh, the reference to the partnership we have with uh, UN Women on 
empowering um, women in rural areas, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, um, all with the objective uh, of uh, developing rural areas, reducing uh, poverty, uh, enhancing food security in rural areas. So I'm very happy to be here to share uh, my views on uh, how uh, to possibly achieve uh, prosperity in rural areas and how to reduce uh, um, the rural-urban divide that is currently exist. And uh, when I was, uh, uh, you know, reflecting a bit, I was trying the entry point. And the entry point is is uh, um, definitely the uh, the announcement uh, uh, that China has eradicated uh, uh, extreme poverty at the end of uh, last year. Uh, this was, uh, um, you know, a remarkable achievement, uh, bringing 800 million people out of poverty in. Uh, basically uh, four decades. Uh, I, I, to me, it's, uh, it's impressive. No other countries can claim to have uh, uh, brought so many people out of poverty in such a short period of time. However, and probably this is the reason why we're here, uh, inequality has not been addressed. Um, the disparity between uh, the coastal areas and the central and western part of China between uh, the, the better off and the worst off uh, regions, and within the same provinces between uh, um, you know, better off areas uh, and worst off areas. And above all, between rural areas and, and urban areas, uh, the, the so-called rural-urban divide. Um, today, about 40% uh, of the population uh, is uh, resident in rural areas. But this percentage is, uh, um, is planned to reduce to 30% in 10 years by, by 2030. The uh, salaries in rural areas are three times lower than uh, in, uh, uh, in urban areas. Uh, and this is the reason why a uh, great part of the population, particularly the active part of the population, the youth, uh, the, the, the active part of the population, migrate uh, from rural areas to, um, to, to, to urban centers. This is not socially sustainable in the long term. Um, it made sense. It was part of the uh, economic uh, growth process that China experienced, but were basically uh, the surplus labor in, uh, in the agriculture sector uh, moved to um, more remunerative sector, sectors, uh, the, the, the sector and tertiary uh, sectors. But it's not sustainable in, in, in the long term, um, you know, dividing uh, families, uh, uh, putting a lot of pressure on the absorbing capacity of, uh, or, or of urban centers. Uh, you know, we, we travel and we interview uh, our beneficiaries in rural areas. Uh, I can tell you that in most of the cases, uh, people that are forced to migrate to urban areas would rather prefer to stay in rural areas, uh, uh, close to their uh, children, close to their families. And the reason why, uh, why they migrate is that rural areas do not offer sufficient uh, uh, job opportunities. So what we can do, and this is, uh, you know, the, the proposed part, what, what we can do to, to reduce this uh, divide? And the answer is, uh, is relatively simple. We need to invest uh, in rural areas, invest uh, in human capacity, investing in creating job opportunities, investing in creating investment opportunities in these areas, so that uh, um, the, the active part of the population is retained or even attract back to the to this uh, to this area. Um, this is, by incidentally, also the, the the core principle of the rural revitalization strategy, which is uh, much broad. But the, the key point is uh, how to make rural areas attractive for people to to live in, so that they can stay or come back if they have uh, migrated in rural areas. So where to invest? Um, the, honestly, and I'm, you know, I'm a bit uh, divided myself because I'm coming from uh, from an organization that is promoting agriculture development. But uh, the agriculture sector in China is uh, so developed uh, that there is uh, objectively limited scope uh, for absorbing uh, uh, the surplus labor in rural areas through the through, ag through the agriculture sector. So the answer is basically through. Uh, activities, new activities outside the agriculture sector, services, uh, tourism, uh, you know, logistic, transport, uh, uh, 
uh, or to a certain extent to service sectors uh, linked to the, to the agriculture sector, uh, restoration, food industry, agro-processing, but it's not uh, agriculture product. Last point uh, uh, here, and I conclude, is a bit a uh, reflection on uh, uh, the smallholder farmers. Uh, uh, agriculture in, in China, uh, as I said, uh, is increasingly modern, commercial, uh, commercial uh, mechanized, but it still rely extensively on uh, the presence of smallholder farmers. And uh, uh, while in the future we may expect that smallholder farmers will, uh, will be a limited percentage of uh, the labor force in the agriculture sectors, we cannot expect that this transition happens from day to night. So what to do with uh, this, uh, um, this significant share of, of the rural population? Um, China should basically aim at a dual strategy to cope with this, uh, uh, with this issue. On the one hand, they should work uh, to uh, absorb, to, to allow uh, the, the smallholder farmers to be absorbed by the increasing commercial agriculture sectors, by strengthening the capacity of uh, of farmers to producing according to farm uh, to uh, to standards or to be linked to the markets, but and here I go back to my previous point, uh, uh, we should invest in creating job opportunities outside the, the, the agriculture sector in rural areas. This is, in my view, where China should uh, um, should focus on in order to um, to promote uh, rural revitalization. And I conclude here, but I would be very happy to answer to any questions later on. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Matteo. So now uh, we will hear from uh, Xu Xiu Li, who is Professor and Dean of College of International Development and Global Agriculture at the China Agricultural University. Uh, Professor Xu, please. Okay. Thank you, Andy. And thanks for the uh, uh, host and all the ladies and the gentlemen. Good afternoon. And, uh, and actually, we're sitting here, since I'm the only <laughs> um, speaker from the academia, so I would like to share some stories about the knowledge. And today, we have heard a lot of uh, stories about success, the success for the cooperation, for the, particularly for the past 50 anniversary. And but during the process, I think one very important uh, secret for the success um, this narrative is uh, how to the new development knowledge generated, integrated the global development experiences and the China's own development trajectory. And then in the new era, how to travel this knowledge, how to travel to our South-South cooperation, and trilateral cooperation. And take my organization as a case study, we can vividly see the process because uh, I'm from China Agricultural University. From the team has been working on the development of cooperation since the 1980s, since the open door policy uh, initiated. And working with lots of uh, international development partners, including our United Nations agencies, including, you know, IFA, the FAO, your World Bank, UNDP, and uh, um, we well integrated the global development experiences with China rural and agricultural development realities. For instance, uh, we facilitated the participatory uh, community development development, uh, development in the China's own poverty uh, alleviation in the new century. And also including other measures, other approaches like uh, microcredits. And all those measures have been mainstreaming the, into China's poverty alleviation um, strategies. Um, and then we, you know, through the process, we provide the technical assistance, uh, including development the program planning, implementation, monitoring, evaluation, and knowledge product production and dissemination. Uh, but then move to the two new century, what should we do? We found a new situation. Lots of our development partners started to seek new knowledge to see how we facilitate uh, South-South cooperation in Africa. 
Um, so uh, since the 2011, early even into the 2009, we start a project in Tanzania. And uh, starting from uh, one village to two village, two village to 10 village, from uh, one household to now thousands of households in the local area. And what we should do, you know, we actually we're using the community development strategies and uh, working with local different actors from the government, from central level to the local level, and also local universities, and as well as our United uh, Nations agencies. And so this from the process, we actually do the things like including capacity building, including the technology, but this uh, appropriate technology uh, dissemination, as well as, um, uh, you know, the uh, dissemination. So from this, uh, we, we, we call it two development experiences sharing. One is a hard copy, it's a kind of labor intensive technology. Another is a kind of a soft, you know, uh, to facilitate how the local government working closely with the university and the local communities to working for the farmers. Send, you know, facilitate them to the fields and to see even, you know, learning and sharing uh, how we, we did and how we practice in China, but to see whether it works out in Africa. For instance, we link these uh, different government officials to the local communities, make uh, like a match, you know, um, to, to improve the efficiency. Um, and uh, later, um, after, after 10 years, we found that this sustainability has been ensured to a certain degree. And uh, we analysis why it come out. We found that firstly, we're working very closely with the, uh, you know, from the um, Tanzania government. Um, the development cooperation or this kind of South-South cooperation should be very emphasized about the ownership of the local stakeholders. So from the central level to the local level, uh, we every time now we use WeChat, even during the pandemic, we cannot see each other. So we interact every day. <laughs> it, seems that, it seems that we use WeChat and also in the forecoming uh, forecast, we still have a, a forum to facilitate the dialogue during the, during the pandemic. So we think that uh, including the um, local stakeholders, particularly about the, the government role, the, um, the ownership is very important. Secondly, we facilitated the, to create a synergies between among the different stakeholders, including government, including universities, including local communities. Uh, previously, uh, I think before 10 years ago, some of the professor from Sukiyani Agricultural University, the local uh, biggest university, will feel very strange, you know, why university professors need to go to the field, working with farmers so closely? And we send them to China to say, you know, how the China Agricultural University's professors also set up stations in the farmer's hand, you know, so how they interact very closely with farmers. So these kind of experiences have been shared. And uh, later we found that they actually, the different actors, they created synergies rather than they, you know, separated and uh, cannot find a common goal. Um, the third is, uh, yeah, we mentioned technology is really important, but it has to be a situated, based, and appropriate, labor intensive, it don't need a very big investment, otherwise they will feel frustrated. It's a simple, start from a simple, and then gradually, gradually, they find their path by themselves. They use their own hand to build uh, the Kijiji house, the village house, and they feel very, you know, uh, very happy to see, okay, we don't need to depend on aid, but rather depend on cooperation. We build up uh, our own assets. Um, so lastly, but also very importantly, through the process, we working together to build up the capacities. I think during the process, not only the Africa improve their capacity for development, but for our Chinese partners, we also learning, you know, how to keep dialogue, how to uh, keep our, our spirit during the process. So my final conclusion is. Yes, we need to, I think that uh, President Xi Jinping just uh, um, 
called for the Global Development Initiative, right? In the 76, um, the general debate, many of my development partners' friends ask me the question, you know, how to understand the Global Development Initiative? And uh, uh, now the story is tell us, understand uh, how China integrated the global development experiences and now how to um, uh, continues to uh, develop, uh, foster a kind of a new experience and development through South-South and trilateral cooperation. So I would like to share more stories later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Xu. Now, last but certainly not least, we will have Cindy Mi, who is the founder of VIP Kids, which is uh, one of China's, perhaps the world's, uh, most successful technology-enabled uh, education platforms. And certainly, I think, having a commercial view, an entrepreneurial view, and finally, a Chinese view on these subjects will be invaluable uh, for our panelists, our audience here, and of course, everyone listening online. Cindy, please. Okay, thank you, Andy. Well, Professor Xu is a uh, academia, and I am the only private sector person, I think. And I'd like to thank uh, President Wan and also Secretary General Romeo to allow me to not only gain all these invaluable insights on global matters, but also be able to uh, you know, get into this in-depth discussion. So common prosperity in education, when I think about this, SDG 4 is something that is irony in my mind, I think, to um, ensure inclusive, equitable education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. That's what I've been doing for the past 23 years. You know, grew up in a very small town in Hebei, uh, where the Olympic Games we held. Um, I didn't go to college, quit high school, taught myself, learned English, taught English, and then, no, here I am. So, no, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no. All I ever hope for is every child who has a desire to learn is able to learn anywhere, anytime, in her own way. So every time when I think about common prosperity in education, three challenges uh, always come to my mind. One, cross-cultural connection. You know, I think the world you know, in COVID is even more difficult for international travels. So how can our kids of all the nations get to love each other? and how could all the teachers change ideas and build a classroom all together. When I work with 100,000 teachers of VIP kids in North America, and then many in Australia and in, in England, I, every time I meet them in person, the hug is so warm, and that every time all the online sessions are in, in, in session, you, you see the love and passion of the teachers to the kids. And then, you know, if in the future there can be a global classroom, for the kids and, and teachers and everyone alike to share ideas. You know, Zoom and all the meeting software has made it all possible. Why not? I would Which believe all this cross-cultural connection, in, the global in session, classroom, you would help love. in a massive way. Secondly, digital literacy divide for learners and teachers alike. Um, my experience working with many teachers in the past since you know, VIP Kid was founded in 2013. The story was teachers learned about VIP Kid and then they thought, oh, it's too good to be true. It must be a scam. <laughs> How can you stay home and get on a laptop, teach a class and make 20 US dollar an hour? And then the, the challenge really is not the teaching, it's how to use the digital tool, how to build their backdrop, how to talk to the kids. And you have to understand, everything you show on the, on the screen, it's mirrored, <laughs> so you gotta make it work. And then you can't be too close to the camera, you can't be too far away. But then I think to build this digital classroom online where learning is accessible, affordable, and personalized, this is where all the equity can happen because you know, all the technology like AI teachers at scale, synchronous um, streaming to all, they're like making learning costs so low. And I think it's 
the, of course, the private sector's job. And you know, I think if with all your support and help and guidance, more people can participate in the endeavor. I can totally imagine you know, teachers in the North America working with you know, other teachers in the world and, and help them build that teaching skills online for digital learning. And then you have you know, many more can be shared among all the teachers around the world. Teachers in Africa can share with teachers in the US and, and show them you know, the world is different from how everyone would picture it. Right? So that also technology can help with the digital divide. Lastly, um, I think it's the social responsibility. Uh, we, had a we have an organization called the VIP Teach. So teachers work with us for free to help students in rural areas. We already helped in the past four years, four or five years, a thousand schools in rural China. Kids have the synchronous connection with teachers around the world to learn English live. So now they know a real person behind the screen. They know this teacher, Alyssa, is from Florida. And then she talks to them every week. And what if many more teachers can participate in this? And I also I think social responsibility is not is a must going forward for private sector. Any company focus on the 17 sustainable development goals can link their company mission to a common prosperity goal, which it belongs to all the humankind. So I think that also requires more guidance uh, from you all, and definitely from CCG, you know, sharing with the companies on what they ought to think for the future, considering stakeholders for all, and also long term. So all you all, I think, I, I've, I've been learning so much. It's so mind-blowing. It is so different from what, you know, in operations we would consider every day, also different from what like teaching and learning look like every day, just to think the big picture and think of the world. And I thank you all for sharing all your valuable insights and look forward to learning more and working with you more in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Cindy. So let me uh, make an attempt at briefly summarizing uh, the many rich and robust comments and insights that have been shared here today. I think, first of all, the importance of children, the importance of women, the importance of education, focusing on agriculture as drivers for sustainable in an ecological sense, but sustainable in an economic and social sense as well is vitally important, as we've heard from our uh, UN colleagues here today. And as Professor Xu uh, touched on, uh, the importance of working with countries. And what struck me in particular is the importance of integrating theory and practice, which if we know about Chinese philosophy is one of the key concepts that we cannot just think of ideas, we should not just be moving our hands, working hard, but we need to link these together, which is in some sense different from a more Western metaphysical tradition, um, and that even professors should be out in the field getting their hands dirty. And of course, I think Cindy's story is very inspirational, and that what made me think of, uh, what your, your story made me think of is two things. Uh, one, the importance of digital inclusion. So you talked about a digital divide, and we know that one of the things that China has been doing and been very successful at is uh, developing, distributing, and selling inexpensive smartphones in parts of the world like Africa, South Asia, and especially for women, the ability to be online opens doors to education, opens doors to other forms of empowerment, economic empowerment, social empowerment. And there are many, many more uh, Cindy Mees out there uh, in India, in Nepal, in parts of Africa as well. And the last point I want to make is that digital inclusion today also means financial inclusion. So we know that in the financial world, banking people is very expensive. If you have to build branches, brick and mortar branches, it's very expensive. But also, uh, providing these services uh, can be prohibitively expensive for the poor. And one of the exciting developments this year, I think that's very important, besides the number of things uh, uh, we heard from our illustrious uh, keynote speakers, our panelists, 
uh, is the rollout of China's digital currency, uh, the central bank, a CBDC, or the digital yuan. Because what that provides the ability to, at least theoretically, zero transaction cost micropayments. And when you think about merchants, whether you're a woman operating a small convenience store in a village uh, with a QR code with no uh, hardware investment cost other than an inexpensive smartphone, you can now enjoy not only digital inclusion but financial inclusion as well. Uh, that this can really be a game changer uh, around the world. Um, I want to end on two points. Um, one that um, as His Excellency uh, Wu Hongbo touched on, that China has put five million officials in the field uh, to achieve this goal of poverty alleviation, and that this kind of political will with the execution ability is vital, and that countries around the world hopefully will see this and look for ways that are locally, nationally appropriate uh, to achieve similar kinds of results. And lastly, as uh, Professor Lee uh, mentions in his book, that we really do need to make central the linkages between people, society, and nature. So in the interest of time, I was informed by Dr. Tang that we do need to end here. I apologize, not that we won't have time uh, for further discussion or Q&A uh, Q with the audience, but I'm sure our panelists would be more than happy to take questions, and I'm certainly happy to take questions afterwards. And I want to thank everybody for their time today, for their valuable contributions. And uh, I will end it here and turn it over to Zoon Ahmed, who will be moderating our second panel. Over to you, Zoon. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> what an inspiring panel discussion this has been. Um, and I would also like to add the keynote speakers also. I think each person contributed something that has shifted what I would like to introduce our intended topic with. So the second panel is going to focus on sustainable development, uh, also climate action, and really China's achievements, the UN and China's partnership, how that is encouraging, like Dr. Wang also mentioned in his uh, keynote, that it is encouraging many developing countries. Many of us here come from developing countries. We understand that uh, seeing China's progress, seeing um, knowing the number 800 million people, like Matthew mentioned, uh, but actually seeing even one or two of those cases in person makes you realize what kind of an impact this hard work has had. And the fact that it's happened uh, means that it is possible. We just need to understand our own circumstances, understand what are our strengths, what do our people need, prioritize people. Before um, I move uh, forward to our wonderful panel two, I will also quickly uh, make some remarks. It's not a detour, it really connects with our topic in the second panel. Uh, Mr. Khan, you mentioned how uh, UNESCO and China share a friendship. And really, um, what you mentioned about World Heritage Sites um, and how this is not just about beauty, it's, it's about much deeper than that. It's also, I think, about respecting history, respecting that every culture, every civilization, and hence every country can contribute. It is what the United Nations stand for, unity. And uh, it is also interesting that um, part of CCG's vision uh, is also a Global Young Leaders Dialogue, and what you mentioned is what we experienced in person. So we, through these experiences of respecting Chinese heritage, other countries' heritages, also are able to visualize a shared future. And I think in the end, we are all trying to nurture a community of uh, people, young people uh, especially, who can think away from some minute uh, definition of success in terms of financial goals and targets and really think about their future success in terms of impact, social impact. So that's what we are here perhaps to brainstorm about. Um, as was mentioned by the speakers, we are celebrating some key milestones. We must celebrate milestones um, because it makes us realize what we are capable of. Uh, but it is also, we're using this celebration as an opportunity to think about the way forward. 
And uh, that is what we are going to discuss today, briefly an overview of the topic. Um, we want to talk about climate action, sustainable development. As someone who also studies the Belt and Road Initiative, seeing the SDGs get intertwined with the Belt and Road Mandate was very significant uh, for me personally and for many people. We need to think about growth with development. Um, how, can, uh, how can we also convince decision makers? Um, for, for instance, uh, someone mentioned this, that we are not just talking about um, ideas. We need to see them into practice. We need to provide the right incentives. And therefore, we must also think about ways that we can incentivize national governments uh, to think in a broader sense, to think about the fact that sustainable development is the sustainable way forward for them as well. These are key decisions that need to be made. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to think about how youth can be engaged in a more effective way. So without further ado, let's give the floor to our first speaker, Ms. Fiat Trunkman from UNDP. Uh, you will talk, uh, if you could talk about sustainable development globally, uh, China's experience, and also um, the critical question of financing. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Zun, and uh, thank you uh, to the China, China Center for Globalization and, and the resident coordinator's office also for uh, organizing today's event to celebrate China in the United Nations, uh, 50 years of China in the United Nations uh, and the partnership between China and the United uh, Nations. Now, before I fast forward, let me follow the example of my uh, colleagues to also just say one quick word about UNDP in China. Um, UNDP opened our offices in uh, 1979 uh, when the UN presence in China uh, was established. So we just celebrated the, the 40 years. And I think as part of these 40 years of partnership, we've really seen the nature of partnership moving from classical technical assistance programs, uh, training, supporting the implementation of uh, village-based, large-scale poverty uh, programs to looking together with China at the next frontier of development uh, and providing advice on those critical frontier issues uh, such as the green economy transformation, the digitization, uh, SDG financing, but also uh, South-South cooperation, China as a, an actor on the international scene, a provider of South-South uh, uh, cooperation, um, supporting the sharing of uh, China's uh, lessons and uh, achievements, but also supporting alignment of China's uh, provision of uh, uh, assistance with uh, the global agendas and the SDGs. Um, and on a personal note, I, I mean, you can see from the programmatic shift how vastly China has changed. The China of 79 is obviously not at all anymore the China of uh, uh, 2021. And I can personally attest to that because I actually served here as a young officer in the end 90s, 2000s with UNDP, literally my uh, first and a half type of job was uh, uh, UNDP. And, uh, you know, that the China of, of that time and the programs that we ran in that time is literally irrecognizable. It is, it is not the same at all. And, and it really goes to show how deep the transformation and how fast the change of China is over the last uh, uh, four decades. Now, as we gather sort of looking forward, I think Climate change is undoubtedly, I think, the biggest uh, challenge of uh, our times. Um, the most existential, existential crisis uh, facing humanity. And I think China and the U UN have a critical role to play in the fight against climate change and to avert uh, global calamity. So I think it's quite fitting that we are addressing this particular subject uh, today in this uh, symposium. And I, I wanted to make uh, three points in, in my remarks. Uh, first of all, looking at the global context of uh, uh, climate change. Um, 
then looking at China's domestic context, how China is addressing that. And then thirdly, looking at uh, financing the transition to carbon neutrality and uh, UNDP's work in that uh, area in particular in, in China. So as you know, 2021 is the super year of uh, climate change, right? With the two COPs, the COP uh, uh, 15, the biodiversity COP in uh, Kunming uh, that laid the groundwork for the post-2020 uh, global biodiversity uh, framework and the post-26 on climate change that just opened in uh, Glasgow yesterday. Now, with the current country commitments that we have, the so-called nationally determined contributions, the world is on pace for a catastrophic 2.7 degrees in warming, right? The uh, resident coordinator uh, quoted the uh, secretary general, he calls it code red. And therefore to stay within the 1.5 degrees, within the 1.5 degrees, current action, uh, concrete action and, and concerted efforts, I think are very much needed. Um, climate change is obviously not an issue that one country can deal with alone. It transcends uh, borders. And I think as such, the COP26 is the moment for international cooperation that the world really cannot afford to squander. So China has an important role to play on these agendas. And I think President Xi's announcements uh, on the uh, Kunming 1.5 billion Jaminbi biodiversity fund, uh, but also the announcement uh, on the stop of building coal power plants overseas are critical and very much welcome signals. Now, on the domestic, in the domestic con context, President Xi's 2030-2060 pledges for uh, uh, carbon peaking and carbon uh, neutrality are critical steps and, and very important commitments of China addressing uh, the global climate crisis. And I think to meet these commitments, China has already is already in the process of taking several steps, including by issuing a series of uh, policy documents. The 14th five-year plan includes overall commitments on addressing climate change. The guidance and the action plan uh, that were released last week as part of the One Plus N uh, strategy offer a concrete roadmap for China to achieve the climate uh, goals. Now, as part of this uh, transition, transforming energy systems from fossil fuels to renewables will be crucial. And China's current energy mix, we know, is currently still very much fossil fuel based. But this is changing. China has committed to reach 50% of uh, non-fossil energy share in its power generation by 2030. Um, and China's low carbon economy sectors are actually benefiting from this shift. If you look at uh, grid technology, if you look at industries in battery storage, if you look at e-vehicles, uh, e-mobilities, and all of which China is a, is a leader. Now, I think building on these concrete plans that just came out uh, as part of the one plus N strategy, China now has the opportunity to accelerate further the progress towards keep, uh, peaking, carbon peaking and carbon uh, neutrality. And I think to this end, it's important to peak emissions as early as possible, ideally plateauing off by 2025 or shortly thereafter. So now, there, there are many policies that will require focus to, to address the climate uh, crisis, such as the energy transition or green jobs, or the just transition, carbon pricing, fossil fuel subsidy reform. But in the interest of time, I will just focus on, on financing. 
the amount of money that is needed to be invested in addressing climate change will need to be ramped up dramatically. And that is what a lot of the conversations in Glasgow are about. To achieve zero emissions by 2050, annual global investments in clean energy and clean efficiency uh, and energy efficiency, there is 4.4 trillion dollars annually required to make that uh, shift. If we look at uh, climate uh, finance for adaptation, we currently only have we haven't met the 100 million per year that uh, we con uh, committed to in Paris. Of the 80 million per year, there's only 21% going into adaptation, which is absolutely vital for developing countries. Uh, and so quite far off from the 50-50 ratio that Paris had uh, um, committed to. For China, to achieve carbon neutrality, an additional $20 trillion of investments in the energy transformation will be required between 2020 and 2050. So we're talking massive amounts of monies, right? And to address all of this, I think that there, there is a few levers that we can look at. First is redirecting public investments and government budgets from climate nature negative to climate nature positive. And that means investing in renewables, it means investing in green sectors and to end support for fossil fuels. The second lever is leveraging the market tools, uh, like carbon pricing to incentivize sustainable management practices while discouraging investments into harmful practices. And the, the, the proceeds of this can actually be used to offset some of the social impact that the green energy transformation and the climate uh, uh, transformation will, will have on vulnerable populations. The third lever is creating politi policy incentives for corporate investments into green development and ensure corporate uh, accountability and encourage green finance uh, tools uh, to be used by uh, financial institutions. So as UNDP, we've been actually working in on accelerating investments into the green transition and putting nature and climate at the core of development and at the core of decision making. Globally and in China, we've, for example, worked on investment standards and taxonomies to help direct investments towards the SDGs and nature positive low carbon pathways. UNDP is also the secretariat of the G20 uh, Sustainable Finance Group, which is co-chaired by the US and uh, China, and which, which coordinates uh, efforts on mobilizing international uh, green finance and aligning financial systems with uh, the global finance goals. UNDP also has the development, uh, the Biodiversity Finance Initiative that develops uh, national biodiversity finance plans and implements finance uh, solutions to close the global biodiversity financing gap. And Biofin actually operates in 40 countries. China has just joined this effort uh, this summer. And together with the Norwegian government, uh, UNDP supported China in the establishment of the uh, national carbon trading uh, market, which opened in July and is the la largest uh, emissions trading system in the world. So there's a lot uh, going on. And I think as UNDP, we've been a proud partner of these efforts over the last uh, few decades on addressing climate change and biodiversity. Uh, climate change continues to be the centerpiece of our new country program and we stand ready to continue supporting uh, China in addressing these issues uh, uh, going forward, contributing to global development and to averting catastrophic climate change and biodiversity loss. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Piate. Really, um, when we talk about these hard numbers and think about what, what all needs to be done, uh, maybe some creative ways to nurture young people, children. This should be household conversation, these common problems, common challenges. These should be the numbers we should be quoting, incentivizing people to work towards something that is affecting all of us. So one initiative that I came across in uh, China is how little children between 8 to 12 years old, year olds are doing COP26 um, uh, basically something like model UN, model COP26. And I think, I mean, I never had this kind of an education, but if collectively, globally, we can think of more creative ways for people to realize how dire the situation is, then perhaps uh, those gaps can be filled faster. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, uh, Ms. Justine Colson, your comments will be directly connected because we are not just talking about, here we're talking about where we are lagging behind and you will talk about the, the, the connection between health and climate change, really how n people are being affected by this and what are the possible solutions what can possibly be done? So the floor is yours. Um, thanks so much, Zuna. I think just building on Beatty's comments, appreciation to our hosts and our speakers um, today. And just to introduce my agency, so I work for UNFPA, which is the United Nations Population Fund. We've had a presence in China for over three decades, and during that time, really worked closely in cooperation on issues of population dynamics, sexual and reproductive health, empowerment and, and well-being of women and young people. And I think going back to Director General Tian's comments, you know, as um, China has really seen a, a phenomenal improvement in terms of addressing maternal mortality and maternal health, now really leveraging that expertise in China to focus on less developed countries and to take that expertise out with the foreign assistance that China's providing. So I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to talk about the interlinkages between climate change and health. And the reason for that is because very often, particularly at the time of a COP, and as you know, COP26 started on Sunday in Glasgow, the focus tends to be much more on the issues that Beata touched on. So those themes and issues around emissions and financing of mitigation measures, and sometimes the linkages between climate change and negative health outcomes can get lost. But we know on a daily basis that populations all around the globe are experiencing negative health outcomes because of climate change. So we know that when we see extreme weather events, rising sea levels, heat stress, poor air quality, linked to those, you will see increased morbidities and increased mortalities. And it's sometimes those are acute. So, for example, if you look back to July when we saw the extreme heat dome in North America, the numbers of people that died because of that were really very clear. But there are also sometimes hidden longer term effects that we're seeing. So, for example, there's a growing body of research focusing specifically on the challenges that outdoor workers are facing. So those in construction, those in agriculture, where repeated exposure to extreme health is actually creating chronic health problems. And the health sector agencies such as ours, WHO and other players in the health sector are really starting to think through what we can do to address uh, these problems. So to really put climate change and health on the agenda, um, just last month, WHO launched uh, a report on climate change and health, which was developed in partnership with agencies such as mine and actually over 150 organizations from around the world that are passionate on this issue. And that report set out 10 priority actions to address the health crises within the context of climate change. And that report very much recognizes that when you see a temperature increase, whether one degrees, two degrees, half a degrees, you will see million more deaths across the globe. When we look at the relationship between health and climate change, I think of particular concern to UN agencies like mine that focus on health is the fact that the most vulnerable carry the greatest burden of negative health outcomes in this context. So it's, it, it's not just that climate change is a driver of mortality and negative health outcomes, but it's actually also a driver of health inequality. The very inequalities that we have just spent the last 20 years trying to address since the beginning of MDGs. 
So at a global level, it's the least developed countries that are the most affected. And for those of you who've been following the lead up to COP26, you will have heard very clearly the voices of leadership from least developed countries, from small isle development states, really calling out the specific challenges, including health challenges that they are facing because of climate change. But then when we look within borders, you know, what we see every time is it's the most vulnerable again that carry the greatest health burden. It's the poorest, the elderly, the very young, it's women, it's ethnic minorities, it's those with underlying health conditions who are the most affected. And for those of us who work in international development, we know very often that people have multiple overlapping vulnerabilities that only increases the negative health outcome from climate change. You know, for my own agency, which focuses specifically on sexual and reproductive health, we've been particularly concerned in recent years about the direct and indirect impacts of climate change on maternal health. And we are seriously concerned that particularly in countries that maybe have only taken the first few steps forward in improving maternal health, in achieving sustainable development, that that progress is vulnerable and that we risk that we may fall back on the gains we've made in improving those maternal health outcomes because of the impact of climate change. So, for example, we know that increased heat leads to increased risk of stillbirth. We know that increased risk, um, sorry, increased heat leads to increased disease that can affect both mothers, unborn babies and the newborn. We know there's already evidence that shows that climate change is increasing global inequality in maternal nutrition. You know, and in terms of indirect impact, every time there is a climate-related emergency, health services are disrupted, livelihoods are disrupted, and once again we see negative uh, impacts on the health of mothers and newborn. So, to my third point, and I think this builds on nicely from, from what Beata mentioned, because the impact of climate change on health currently puts a huge financial burden on countries. Investing in climate mitigation and adaptation measures contributes to the whole uh, the health of a society on the flip side of that. But when we look at the economic imperative, so um, you know the negative health outcomes, as I say, put a, a huge uh, financial burden. And there are a number of calculations that are done every year to calculate this. But I mean, just to quote one figure at you this year, a report came out suggesting that the annual health cost in the United States alone of climate change is close to 800 120 billion dollars. Now, regardless of whether you want to argue the, you know, the calculation that sits behind that number, what we know is the financial impact is, is great. Now, this is important because when Beata talks about the size of investment that's required by countries to address climate change, I will step in and say yes, but the return on investment you will see in terms of reducing the cost of negative health outcomes is incredibly significant. And this should be a, an additional imperative for countries to make the investments in the mitigation measures that um, Beata is, is referencing. And I mean, maybe just to my final point with an eye on time. So, you know, for those of us who work in the health sector, what do we do? Because we aren't working in the bigger dialogues around emissions and greenhouse gases. That's not where we focus. We're in the clinics, we're looking at the health systems, we're looking at how medicine's moving and whether the health worker is trained. So what is the link then between our actions and the impact that climate change is having? So to take you back to the report that I just mentioned that WHO launched last month, which looks at this relationship between climate change and health outcomes and these, you know, 10 critical actions. So the focus really needs to be on building more resilient and environmentally sustainable health systems. And when we think about resilient health systems, that's a much more immediate focus on adaptation. So how do we build health systems that are much more resilient to the impact of climate change within the context where they are operating? And to do that, countries really need to identify the specific vulnerabilities in their health systems. And these are very often geographically specific. They need to develop very specific contextualized adaptation plans and then implement them. Now, importantly in China, we've already seen um, a, a, a 
recognition of the interplay between climate change and health. So, for example, the National Plan for Tackling Climate Change recognises the benefits of adaptation and mitigation measures to support health. In Healthy China 2030, um, it incorporates reference to targets around air quality and water quality. And notably, and this hasn't happened yet in many countries, there are a number of provinces in China where provinces themselves have actually taken on the initiative to start developing health adaptation plans to ensure that their health systems can fully respond to the immediate changes related to climate change to maintain health of the population. You know, and, and for me, I was really pleased to hear Director General Tian talking about bringing green approaches to um, bilateral, multilateral work and foreign assistance, because I'm already thinking about, well, when we work with, uh, with SCAF, with the South to South Fund here, with China's assistance, how do we bring in these greener approaches to health systems when we work with other countries in, south, in the South? I mean, particularly for us, uh, countries within the continent of Africa. So that, that deals with adaptation, but then when we start thinking about environmental sustainability of health systems, then we're starting to look more at the longer term focus um, and that health systems can make to mitigation. Because health systems aren't passive. You know, what we have to recognize is global health systems contribute almost 5% of global emissions a year. And so whilst at the moment there is a bigger macro level focus on fossil fuels, eventually as progress is made, we're going to start focusing more and more on the role that health systems themselves play actually in contributing to um, climate change. And so, you know, adaptation is now, but there's more and more a focus on building greener health systems. So how do we build health facilities differently with passive cooling, cool roofs? How do we increase energy efficiency? We've started to monitor across you know, the supply chain from the point when a medicine is um, developed and manufactured right down to the point where it's put into a client's hands. Where are the particular contributions along that supply chain to emissions and what can we do to address those now to make these processes um, greener? And I could talk about this issue. As you can see, I'm incredibly passionate incredible. about health and climate change. And, and I'm going to stop there to allow other speakers to this speak. This was Thank absolutely, you. yes, very passionate. Please. And very, very informative. Um, as, as you also talked about... Uh, awareness you know how how can developing countries be made more aware as a think tank we are also playing our humble part and this is this book that uh, obviously andy also mentioned is about helping people become more aware policymakers governments um that this is not just uh, it's it's a sustainable way forward is beneficial in the long term now we have with us ambassador wang hua ambassador um can you please uh, talk about Obviously, China's own uh, success, China's journey in uh, in the in the journey uh, for sustainable development and climate change, and also especially cooperation between China and Africa, China and Latin American countries. We're talking South South cooperation, and also a tender reminder. Um, it would be great if uh, if uh, we can keep, you can keep your remarks uh, a bit short. Maybe um, five to seven minutes would be ideal. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Very sorry. I can only use Chinese to talk. Because I found that when I was listening to the guest speakers, it was just me with the earpiece listening to the translation. My work language can be three languages. Chinese, Siberian language, and Pontian language. The final decision was to use Chinese language as best as possible. 我作为这个，呃，我们全球化智库，呃，最新加入的成员，呃，非常荣幸，呃，在二十四小时成为这个，呃，成员之后，有机会，呃，和各位朋友坐在一块儿，来研究我们人类，我们各国所面临的一些个重大的问题，也是根本性的问题。那么，我们这个单元呢，涉及到气候，也涉及到可持续发展。呃，因为时间有限，我简单的把我自己的三段经历
跟大家分享一下，呃，涉及到扶贫和可持续发展，涉及到中国和联合国的合作。呃，作为一个政府的官员，我曾经有幸在一九九六年到一九九七年，在中国，呃，陕西。最贫困的一个县，呃，担任县委的副书记，县扶贫开发工作的领导小组组长。那么这个县呢，距离西安也就是一百公里左右。之所以叫国定贫困县，就是刚才我们莫天先生提到的，按照现在的贫困标准，按照联合国的贫困标准。一个人一天应该是两美元，而我们那个当时的国定贫困线是一年一个人的收入是十，不是现金收入，是各种各样的收入来源，包括你家养了多少鸡，可能会下多少蛋，你家种了什么果树，可能会来带来果树方面、果子方面的收获等等，加在一块也就是一千人民币左右一年一个人，呃，条件非常艰苦。那么在这一年的扶贫工作期间，呃，我非常感谢联合国相关的机构与我们中西部地区扶贫工作的支持和帮助。我在那儿了解到了联合国推荐的孟加拉模式、小额贷款模式。支持妇女项目，呃，以及其他的一些个方法，我们借鉴联合国所推荐的这些个方式，把我们中国党和政府的一些具体要求，在这个县，呃，开展了我们轰轰烈烈的扶贫工作，呃，短短的几年，让它由一个陕西省最贫困的一个县，成为了。全国当时有一个叫百强县，他也曾经有幸加入过。为什么？因为我们把从日本引进的技术，在他这个黄土高原上，啊，日照好，呃，这个光温差大，那么生产出非常漂亮的服饰苹果，卖到了莫斯科，也把他当地历史上最有名的滨州梨。卖到了越南的河内，它的产品不仅和中国市场，而且和国际市场直接接轨。那么，在这个要想富、先修路以及其他方面，都做了大量的工作。这是我们在国家的一个国定贫困线的一个例子。啊，我非常感谢联合国相关机构给我们带来的一些重要的经验和有效的措施。第二段，就是我有幸以特命全权大使的身份，到非洲的呃几内亚比绍，工作了四年时间，这是二零一三年到二零一七年。什么叫世界上最贫困的国家之一？这四年对我的教育非常非常的深。当一个国家没有电。也就没有自来水，没有电，没有自来水，它的公共卫生情况是可想而知的。那么，呃，我们和联合国驻几内亚比绍的相关机构紧密的合作，我们甚至于一块儿像今天这样开会来研究，对这样一个极度贫困的国家，国家的国民收入。不足以支付公务员工资的国家，我们怎么来解决它的发展问题？那么了解几内亚比绍的朋友知道，从一九七三七四年这个国家独立，成为了一个共和国，一直到二零一三年，这么长的时间，没有一个总统顺利的完成五年的任期。那么。这段时间，每一年最长两年，这个国家就要发生一到两次军事政变
。那么我们在和联合国的朋友一块研究，怎么帮这个几内亚比绍的时候，大家想了很多办法。我也贡献出了一点中国智慧，就是面对这样一个国家，我们既需要用西医的办法，就是西方医学的办法，关键的时刻可能要动一点手术，要吃药，要打针。但是，从长远的这个发展来看，这个国家更需要调动它内生的自己的积极因素，这就需要用中医，就是中国的传统的医疗方法，让它内在的积极性能够调动起来。那么回过来讲，扶贫工作的实质其实跟慈善工作大不相同，它的。不同就在于，一个是我给你，你接受，这是一个慈善活动；另外一个就是我需要改变我的自身的经济社会状况和地位，我只需要你给我提供一点帮助，给我提供一点机会，加上我自身的努力，我一定能够成功。也就是我们共同在研讨的过程当中，我们提出了一个。鸡蛋的理论，假如这个鸡蛋在适当的温度下，它是从内在破壳而出，那么它就是一个生命；而假如在相同的温度下，这个鸡蛋是从外部被打破，它只能是一个鸡蛋，或者是炒鸡蛋，或者是煎鸡蛋。所以。被帮扶方向的自觉，他的这种自发的感受，比什么都重要。那么，最后一个经历就是，当我退休以后，我回到了离开了非洲，回到了中国，我有幸作为一个志愿者，参加了呃中国数以百万计的 NGO 当中的一个组织。叫中国和平发展基金会。我们在二零一九年，呃，决定在我们周边的一个国家搞一个选择一个村，把中国扶贫攻坚的一些经验，希望能够介绍过去，加上我们的资金。我们的想法是在柬埔寨。选择了一个村，制定的是三年扶贫改观这样一个计划。第一年已经过去了，我们接受到的照片反映，这个村庄水泥路已经修起来了，呃，公共照明设备已经完善了，水渠也已经挖通了，解决了自来水的问题。也解决了排水的问题。那么今年是第二年，我们组织村民商量，通过什么办法，靠我们勤劳，靠我们的双手，可以解决我们家庭的生活问题、孩子的上学问题和家人看病能够得到治疗的问题。村民们最后说：“我们有种植的技能。”我们也有养殖的技能，于是在这个村里，我们分成两个组，一个组是养殖，啊，养鸡、养鸭、养猪；另外一个组是种植，种蔬菜，种一些个有很好经济收入的一些个农作物。那么第一个项目是在去年完成的，大家都知道，去年是新冠疫情，啊，肆虐的。啊，这个去年，那么在这种情况下，我们的资金到位后，很快一期的项目就完成了。那么今年，我们相信，在余下的时间里边，当村民们组织起来，我们的资金很快会到位，而明年应该是一个收获的时候。我们也希望将来有好消息向我们的朋友来来发布。那么最后我要讲的，就是无论是气候问题。贫困问题、差异问题、不平等问题等等等等
都是全人类共同面对的问题。这些个挑战需要我们共同努力去解决。非洲人说得好：“一个人走可以走得很快，大家一块儿走可以走得很远。”那么中国也有这样的话，叫“人心齐，泰山都能够移”。我想，经过我们共同的努力，呃，联合国和相关的各国，呃，携手来共同捍卫我们这个家园的秩序，共同推动我们这个家园的发展，未来的世界一定是美好的。谢谢。Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Wang. I actually have so much to say on all three of the speakers on this panel. Uh, the TCM reference was wonderful. Countries are looking for trade, not aid, real, genuine improvement, uh, not just stipends to live. So thank you so much. We are immensely pressed for time, but we also have uh, two great uh, participants with us. So let me first invite Her Excellency Tanya Romaldo, Ambassador of Cape Verde to China, for a brief remark. We really appreciate. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to all, and thank you to um, both United Nations and, of course, CCG uh, for organizing this very important uh, symposium not only to assimilate this date, the 50th anniversary of China's, uh, re the restoration of, of China's uh, rightful, uh, lawful right uh, at the UN nations, um, with a very strong support at that time by African nations. I come from an African country. Uh, I forgot to introduce myself, Tanya Romaldo. I'm the ambassador of Cap Verde to China. Um, and, of course, uh, tackling two very, very uh, important issues that we are all facing, not only in Africa, but globally, sustainable development on one hand and climate change on the other. Um, I only this morning learned about this symposium, and so I did not bring um, written intervention. But even so, I did not want to miss it, because coming from a small island state uh, in development, Cap Verde, we are 10 little islands, both topics are vital for us. Uh, we are working hard to develop the country more, of course, but always having into consideration the need of develop it in a sustainable way. We are looking at uh, UN's Agenda 2030, at the same time also at uh, the African Union's agenda for a development of the Africa that we want, we meaning African people, uh, by 2063. So we have three more years than what's on one of the titles here, um, underlining 2030, 2060. Um, I'm looking at my brief notes here. Uh, yeah, so... Um, when we talk about sustainable development and climate change, uh, as the previous speakers, uh, UNDP, uh, UNESCO, UN Women, um, UNICEF, and so on, underlined, uh, we, well, sorry. Yes, we, we, we of course uh, have to remember uh, some challenges we all had to face during the last two years since the outbreak of COVID um, and then its rapid spread uh, in the world. I'm not going to repeat any of the statistics um, about the negative impact of COVID and COVID uh, on our economies, global economies. But I want to underline one positive aspect. Uh, so COVID confined the world. Uh, everyone uh, was home. Factories were closed. It was all very negative and bad, uh, as I mentioned, not going into these details. But there was one very positive aspect. The nature could recover. Uh, somehow, uh, this negative 
COVID uh, and the employment that it brought and other challenges, for example, on, on women, of course, the biggest victims, um, not only in what comes to employment and their economic participation, but also facing domestic violence, uh, children that could not attend school and so on. But nature proved that if we take care of it, it can recover. So this, for me, is a positive impact. And uh, by proving this, um, oh, yeah. So we, we, we somehow, for those who had not yet understood it, it, it doesn't seem very logical, but until very recently, some people continue to say it's not a problem that we can solve or it's not really that big of a problem. <laughs> so um, now we had a very, very clear proof and it gives us the opportunity to um, start to work harder on the recovery of our, uh, of our planet and assuring that the future generations and our children, our grandchildren, uh, have a better opportunity and um, the chance of survival, because that's what we are talking about here. Um, so um, now very quickly going through what our panel is uh, looking at. Um, Soon mentioned uh, the celebration of milestones, but also the opportunity to look at the way forward, uh, to engage youth. Um, Beate uh, spoke about UNDP, of course, the big challenges, climate change, the COP is now happening in, in Glasgow. Just a few weeks ago, we had another important COP, uh, biodiversity happening in, in China, in Kunmik and both, of course, very, very much related one to another. We cannot really draw lines uh, between the very various challenges that we have on the table. Uh, when um, I think it was also Beate, yes, mentioned the 2.7 uh, degree catastrophe, especially, of course, for everyone, but especially for islands, and especially for those islands whose uh, sea level is very low. Uh, they are not only facing uh, problems with their economy because of the, for example, uh, um, climate, uh, um, the, the very severe weather conditions, but they are facing disappearing from the map. So this is very serious. It can't get any serious than that. Uh, and at COP26 now, uh, those uh, issues are being tackled maybe with a little bit more of awareness than they were during the previous COPs. Uh, President Xi Jinping just uh, pledged for carbon neutrality at uh, the recent General Assembly of um, the United Nations. Uh, we just looked at the need of the huge amounts of financing to prepare ourselves, I mean, as global, globally, to face all these problems that are now affecting us, and the need of more real, direct uh, investment in green development and a transition to a more green development. Um, Basically, uh, maybe I could uh, a brief comment on Ambassador Wang, who spoke about his uh, experience in Guinea-Bissau, also a small uh, country in Africa, same region as my own, West Africa, and they also have some islands. So part of our challenges are their challenges. We are now heading towards FOCAC, 2021 in Dakar, by the end of this month, uh, Ambassador Ndiaye from Senegal, but also Ambassador Osman from the, United, from the African Union mentioned this. And there is a big opportunity uh, for 
us to work together as African nations with China, but of course also with the support of UN and its different agencies, because all of the issues that we spoke about here will be also on our FOCAC agenda. For the very first time in 2021, after 21 years of FOCAC, we will finally have a paragraph dedicated to women and equality. It was not there yet. There was only one sentence, one sim simple sentence, uh, the one where we spoke about um, the people-to-people -people exchanges, and this sentence ends with women and youth. But that was it. There was no further development, no the action plan. And so this year, uh, finally, and uh, we are very happy about it, we, help, we will also have this issue on our FOCAC documents, outcome documents. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Really very important points. And now let's invite uh, Ms. Vivian Tan, Deputy Representative UNHCR. Um, a brief comments on the topic would be wonderful. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Vivian Tan from UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. We have been working with China for more than 40 years now. Um, I just wanted to thank um, the speakers for sharing their experience, their passion, and their recommendations and insights um, on this issue. And also to come back to uh, a point that um, Ambassador Wu raised in his opening comments. Uh, I was very grateful that he mentioned uh, displaced people uh, and cited a figure. Um, because often people who are forced to flee refugees um, are they you know fall off the radar because you know they're foreigners uh, they don't fall into the national development plan of their own country or the country that's hosting them so it's easy to forget about people like that um, and also what he said was all um, that tens of millions of people have been displaced not just by conflict but I think also natural disasters and this links back to the point that increasingly uh, climate change is uh, becoming a driver of forced displacement, not just conflict, but climate change. Um, by this, I mean that people are fleeing not just the direct impact of extreme weather events like typhoons, but also indirect consequences like uh, drought causing food shortages or scarce resources causing tension that lead to conflict among communities. So. Um, increasingly, we're seeing displacement as a result of uh, climate change um, events. And also coming back to Ambassador Tanya's point, I mean, small island states uh, like yours, like mine, Singapore, um, are facing a crisis as, as water levels rise, um, leading to the risk of statelessness when entire countries might just disappear. Then what would I be a citizen of? So big questions like that, that affect um, my agency and the people we help. So um, from our perspective, uh, carbon neutrality and clean energy is an important part of the solution. And we're looking to China and leveraging China's strengths um, as a producer and investor of clean energy to really look at how we can find more sustainable ways to manage humanitarian operations like ours. Um, just simple things like, you know, working with uh, solar panel producers um, to, to make sure that uh, there's electricity in camps, uh, working with other innovators to find cheap and uh, affordable, clean sources of co cooking fuel so that refugees don't contribute to the problem by, you know, cutting down trees to in order to cook with firewood, which, which has been a problem in the past, but we're trying to address that. So um, those are just some of the ways we're looking to China and working with China to find solutions to, small solutions to this problem, and also looking to initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, in countries, for example, like Pakistan with the Economic Corridor, uh, and Pakistan, as we were talking, is also a major host country for Afghan refugees. Trying to find synergies where in refugee hosting areas in Pakistan, you know, can some of these um, hydropower projects, you know, create livelihoods, not just for the refugee hosting communities, the locals, but also refugees uh, who are living among them. So those are just some of the ways we're hoping to work with China on this issue. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Tan. We are truly privileged to have uh, such insightful and inspiring comments and speakers. Uh, we are concluding the panel, but the conversation will definitely continue. So thank you so much once again for being with us and for adding so much value to a topic that matters. So with that, let's call Ms. Italian Dovara. Okay, let's, let's have a round of applause for everyone who has participated. And with that, it's, uh, without any further ado, let's invite Dr. Mabel Miao. Please, please. Uh, Dr. Mabel is the vice. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we approach the end of today's symposium to co commemorate the 15th anniversary of the restoration of China's law siege in the United Nations, on behalf of Center for China and the Globalization, I want to express my great gratitude to our honor guests and the speakers today. It has been a meaningful afternoon to listen to so many extremely inspiring insights from representatives from the United Nations China family, including UNICEF, uh, UNICEF, UNICEF, UN Women, UNFPA, UNHCR, and UNDP, as well as experts from China Agriculture University, China Foundation for Peace and Development, and the Embassy of Cape Verde to China, and the CCG Fellows. Realizing the rights of the children and the women and the bolstering rural development as important parts of a sustainable development are to be guided by the United Nations Charter and the, the 2013 UN Agenda. China's recent establishment of long-term goal of common prosperity echoes with the SDGs. And as China is supposed to embrace multilateralism on the road towards a green, a green future, carbon neutrality will create numerous opportunities for partnership with the United Nations and its agencies in China in the future. As Mr. Siege Strategy, Ambassador Wu Hongbo, DG Tianlin and Dr. Hui Yao Wang all pointed out at the start of this event, the last 15 years of China in the United Nations has been a story of changing making. However, given the global challenges in today's circumstances and the success of the next 15 years of China in the United Nations demands fast actions from all parties involved to defend multilateral cooperation and uh, contribute to global governance and promote sustainable development. Today, we heard so many touching stories of the United Nations and the China cooperation in the past 15 years related to the education, women, children, culture exchanges, agriculture, and um, climate change, of course, including people mobility. Um, another important part of today's event is quite impressive for me. Uh, as the ambassador from uh, African Union and from Senegal, the friendship between China and Africa go back a long way. And uh, this long-term friendship has laid a fundamental foundation for cooperation between China and African countries. CCG is a strong supporter for this. In December last year, CCG held, held the Ambassador Roundtable on China and the world in the period of China's 14th Five Years Plan, inviting over 16 African ambassadors and representatives to discuss new opportunities for international cooperation in the 40, 15, uh, 14th Five Year Plan, and ways to strengthen cooperation between China and African countries. Especially, we. Uh, between China and the African continental free trade area. Today, CCG is also actively engage, uh, active engaging in conducting research, drafting policy brief, and engaging in discussing in order to advance this unique friendship between China and the African. Growing up in the context of the an ever-changing China and the world that has become more and more globalized. 
CCG have passions for promoting globalization and multilateralism and the power of young people in the future of the world. That's why I launched the Global Young Leaders Dialogue, GYLD, last year, supported by Mr. Uh, Mr. Sir Jad, uh, Chatterjee and uh, so many ambassadors here and the representatives from uh, UN China family. Thank you so much. Now it's time for young people, young power in China, the world. I hope GLD can make the Chinese experience more interesting and uh, hope young people around the world can understand China more. Finally, I want to congratulate, congratulate Mr. Sid Chatterjee and uh, Dr. Hui Yao Wang. Under your leadership, we have working for a few months to organize this event. And the thanks colleagues from United Nations China offices and the CCG staffs. Without your assistance and without your contribution, we couldn't have the so, so successful event so far, I believe it's successful. CCG is excited to work sh shoot by shoulder by United Nations in China and to embrace multilateralism and do pragmatic work. Thank you, all of you. And we look forward to more cooperation, more 15 years cooperation between China and the United Nations to come. Thank you so much. Once again, uh, please make sure to scan the QR code printed on uh, um, the print copy of the agenda so you will get instant access to the photo album. Um, uh, uh, on the agenda, you have a QR code. Yes, for, uh, for the... Uh, it, it's very nice, instant and airbrushed. So thank you again. Make sure you don't take the interpretation device with you. And we look forward to seeing you all in our future events. Thank you.